Test, test. Ja, se sliši. Super, hvala lepa. Darko, pozdravljen. Dobar dan. Lep pozdrav vsem, se vidimo, slišimo. Ja, slišimo se dobro. No, čau, čau. Kot mi pravijo, srednjata bomo začeli točno, točno ob devetih. Tako da se dejmo pripraviti, ker se rektorju malce modi. Potem si bomo pa mi lahko privoščili še kaj povedati. Dear colleagues, dear friends, we are here. Do you hear me? Do you... Vse, za enkrat imamo samo enega stojina, Darko. Ne vem, ki je, koli ste mogoče se bo potem šele vklopili, vse niso je bila fiksno dogovorjena, pač za neko manjeko zdi šlo. Da ga ne izgovarjam napačno, ampak se me bo že popravil, če se bom smotil. Nisi pogledal po Google, kako se ne zgovori. Ah, veš kako je s temi skandinavskimi jeziki, to je da. Približno vem ja, ampak. Mislim, da mi bo odpustil, če se bom malo zmotil. Če ne nas bo pa popravil, pa je. Ma ja, se, samo da vidim, če še moja kamera dela. Aha, evo, tukaj sem jaz. Dobro, da je sklopil za enkrat. Lepo pa, da je kasalec zraven, to pa me veseli. Dobro, pa bomo še kakšno minuto počakali. Mislim, da bi bilo najboljše, da vse eno počakamo do kakšni, ja, do devetih, no se to bo čez dve minuti. Ko se nam pridruži gospod rektor, ne? Ja, seveda, seveda. Absolutno. Lahko samo jaz nekaj vprašam, glede PowerPointa, vse je dovoljeno, da ga lahko tako je vključim, ko bom na vrsti, ne? Ko boste na vrsti, ja. Ok, hvala. Hvala in gost. Rad bi samo upozoril vse sodelujoče, da v kolikor ne govorite, da imate izklopljene mikrofone in kamere. Torej, kamero vklopite in mikrofon takrat, ko ste na besedi, oziroma ko želite nekaj povedati. Hvala. Tudi ja se javljam praktično iz postelje, tako da lep pozdrav in odličen, odličen dogodek želim. Čau. Hvala vam te.
Darko, se mislim, da lahko začnemo počasi. Ja, točno deveta ura se mi je pokazala na računalniku. Lep pozdrav vsem. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to our international conference, Cultural Memory of Nation and State Building, Slovenia and Europe. Uh, sedaj pričakujemo uh, gospoda rektorja Univerze v Mariboru, da nas pozdravi. We are uh, waiting for our Chancellor, rektor of the University of Maribor, uh, Professor Zdravko Kačić. He is here and you have your word. Please, Professor. Hvala lepa, dear ladies and gentlemen, poštovani Profesor Dr. Darko Friš, dekan Filozofske fakultete Univerze v Mariboru, Profesor Dr. Darko Darovec, vodja projekta v organizacijski odbor konference, cenjeni goste, predavatelji in drugi udeleženci konference, drage študentke in študenti. Dvodnevna mednarodna znanstvena konferenca, ki se je začela danes, je del projekta Kultura spominjanja kradnikov slovenskega naroda in države, ki ga od julija 2018 sofinancira javna agencija za raziskovalno dejavnost Republike Slovenije in se bo zaključil konec tega meseca. Namen projekta je preučevanje fenomena oblikovanja slovenskega naroda in države, kar je s konferenco razširil na preostalo Evropo, zato se nam kot referenti na konferenci predvzujejo ogledni raziskovalci iz Slovenije. K malo bo domnila 30 letja od zadnjih velikih tranzicijskih procesov, ki jih je bil deležen evropski, s tem pa tudi svetovni in slovenski prostor. To je razpad večine socialističnih in oblikovanje novih nacionalnih držav, v tem tranzicijskem procesu je prvič v zgodovini nastala tudi samostojna država Slovenija, ki v mnogih pogledih deli vsodo s sosednjimi jugovzhodnimi nacijami, predvsej bolj kot so srednje evropskimi, ki se ponašajo z dolgotrajno državno tradicijo. Pri tem zadnji evropski tranzicijski procesi kažejo zanimivo značilnost in sicer povrate k starem. Leto 1989 ne predstavlja nobenega revolucionarnega ustoličanja novih vrednot, temeč obnovo starih, kot so kapitalizem, nacionalizem in religija. Zato ne čudi, da se v zadnjih 30 letih na področju drugoslovnih in humanističnih let ponovno pospešeno raziskuje fenomen etičnosti, etničnosti, moderne nacije, nacionalizma in identitete. Izoblikovanje modernih nacij lahko spremeno v okviru modernega meščanskega gibanja, ki se je po večjem delu Evrope razvijalo od poznega 18. stoletja, ter se je oblikovalo kot politično, gospodarsko in kulturno gibanje. Projekt je osredotočen na interdisciplinarno poučevanje različnih vidikov oblikovanja etnične in nacionalne identitete, zgodovinski, kulturološki, antropološki, pravni in drugi. Pri tem se je treba zavedati, da se zgodovina nacionalna identiteta in kultura tvorijo retrogradno, prek interpretacije v sodobnosti lociranega subjekta. Projekt zato izhaja iz hipoteze, da so simboli, miti, obredi, podobe, spomini, komunikacije, državne ideologije in zgodovinopisje odločilni sooblikovalci identitete skupnosti in posameznikov. Zato bo posebna pozornost konference namenjena raziskovanju njihove reprezentacije in konstrukcije v smislu njihove integracijske vloge pri povezovanju skupnosti in konstruirano zgodovinske resnice. Zlasti na primerih kulturnih proizvodov kot so likovna umetnost, arhitektura, književnost, zgodovinopisna dela, popularna kultura, sredstva množičnega uveščanja in drugo. Verjamem, da bo današnja konferenca pomembno prispevala k zavedanju pomembnosti spominjanja in razumevanja današnjega časa skozi spoznanja zgodovinskega spomina. Želimo uspešno delo, prijetno druženje in ostanite zdravi. Hvala. Spoštovani gospod rektor, najlepša hvala. Veseli me, da se v roku enega tedna že drugič srečava pri takih in podobnih 
priredi tva hupam, da jih bo še več. Ne? Uh, zahvaljujem se vam za to razmišljanje in bi predal sedaj besedo uh, profesorju Darku Frišu, dekanu fakultet, uh, filozofske fakultete in pa tudi seveda mojemu dolgoletnemu sodelavcu in prijatelju. Izvolite, Darko, prosim. Hvala lepa, gospod predsedujoči, spoštovani gospod rektor Univerze Maribor, redni profesor dr. Cerav Kačič, spoštovani redni profesor dr. Peter Jambrek, spoštovani direktor inštituta Nove Rivije Tomaš Zalaznik, spoštovani predsednik organizacijskega in programskega odbora in vodja projekta, redni profesor dr. Darko Darovec, spoštovane referentke, spoštovani referenti, spoštovani predstavniki medijev, spoštovani drugi udeležici konference, dragi študentke, dragi študenti. Kot je bilo že povedano, je današnji simpozi korona, bi se lahko rekla, ali pa zaključek projekta kultura spominjanja gradnikov slovenskega naroda in države, ki je, kot je bilo že povedano, od julja 2018 poteka na Filozofski fakulteti Univerze v Mariboru, poleg tega pa seveda tudi še na, na ostalih torej, partnerskih institucijah. Žal je tako, da konference na našem delu, ko jo organiziramo že drugič v zadnjem tednu, potekajo zaradi pandemije COVID-19 po spletu, In seveda to je glavno orodje znanstvenih srečanj in vse bolj tudi znanstvenega dela, vsaj v zgodovnem pisju, seveda pa le v meri, ki jo omogoča digitalizacija virov in, torej, virov in literature. Ker je gospod rektor zelo izčrpno opisal tudi vsebino samega projekta, bi se rad na tej otvoritveni slovesnosti v prvi vrsti zahvalil predsedniku organizacijskega in programskega odbora, profesorju dr. Darko Darocu in predvsem tudi članu odbora, dr. Mateje Matjašič Friš in docentu dr. Žigano, Žigi Omanu za pripravo tega imenitnega dogodka. Vsem referentom in referentkam pa želim vsebinsko in strokovno bogato virtualno druženje. Hvala lepa. Poštovani kolega, dekan, hvala za tvoje spodbudne besede. Morda bi predlagal, kot so se prej dogovarjala Žigo, da čisto nakratko povzame za naše mednarodne goste in da potem prejdemo k naslednjim pozdravom. Uh, thank you, Darko. We have by now heard the welcoming speeches from the Chancellor of the University of Maribor, Professor Zdravko Kacic, and the Dean of the Faculty of Arts of the same university, Professor Darko Friš. Uh, next, I would like to welcome the President of the new university, which is a project partner, uh, Dr. and Professor uh, Peter Jambrek to address the conference, the conference in a few words. Uh, no, potem bomo malo zamenjali vrstni red. Darko, če se strenjaš, pa bi kar napovedali direktorja Inštituta Nove revije Zavode za humanistiko, gospoda Tomaža Zareznika, da z nekaj besedami nagovori konferenco. Izvolite. Spoštovani udeležnici konference, Tudi sam se pridružujem vsem čestitkam, ki so jih že izrekli moji prethodniki. 
in upam, da bo ta konferenca, ki je pomembna za obnaši obletnici, dobila tist potrebni odmev, ki si ga pravzaprav vsi predavatelji tudi želijo. Da ne ponavljam vseh besed, ki so jih že rekli moji predhodniki, bi morda samo to omenil, da gradnike naroda in države vedno ustvarjajo posamezniki, ki se tudi za njih polskih ali nevarnih okolj, ki so se v njih odločali in delali in jih ni bilo strah, predvsem pa, da so imeli pogum za svoja dejanja. Zato me ta konferenca še posebej veseli ob naši obletnici. Samo toliko in hvala lepa ter lepo konferenco vsem oddeljencem. Na svijenje. Tomaš, najlepše hvala za pozdravne besede, za tvoje sodelovanje in seveda tudi sodelovcev tvojega inštituta, s katerim seveda sodelujemo že vrsto let uspešno. Sedaj pa kar ne enkrat ostalo veliko časa za mne. Torej, kako predstaviti pravzaprav projekt kulture spominjanja gradnikov slovenskega naroda in države, kot je naslov v slovenščini tega projekta. Sveda je bil povod temu tudi obletnica, torej sedaj prav v teh dneh bomo praznovali 30-letnico nastanka oblikovanja slovenske države. Vendar pa smo se zgodovinarji sveda tudi še v predhodnem obdobju in kot je bilo rečeno v tej strani gospoda rektorja v zadnjem času še bolj pospešeno ukvarjali in se ukvarjamo sveda se zgodovinskimi procesi, ki so pripeljali do oblikovanja posameznih skupnosti, do teh procesov v zgodovini, sveda ki so povezani en z drugim, v oblikovanju sodobnih skupnosti. Prav bi rekel, poglobljena analiza raznih vplivov, sveda zlasti kulture spominjanja, humanistike kot take, družboslovja pri oblikovanju identitet posameznih skupnosti se nam je zdel v ospredju našega raziskovalnega interesa. In prav to želi po svoje, torej termin, lahko bi rekli metodologija, teorija, kulture spominjanja, tudi povdariti. In zato smo naš projekt naslovili s kulturo spominjanja, kjer pa ne želimo pristajati, bi rekel, samo na enega, en teoretski, metodološki pristop, kot je kultura spominjena oziroma cultural memory, tem več vključevati tudi druge sodobne metodološke pristope. Čeprav bi lahko rekel, da je prav ta pristop, torej kulture spominjanja, tak, ki vključuje že do sedanje številne metodološke pristope pri obravnavi identitet skupnosti pri obravnavi, torej gradnje, gradnikov, naroda in nacije oziroma države oziroma nation and state building, kot je to že zelo uveljavljen termin v svetovni zgodovinski stroki. Zelo me veseli, da imamo kar nekaj gostov iz tujine, še več se jih je sprva javilo, da bodo sodelovali na našem simpoziju, potem so nekateri žal morali zaradi drugih obveznosti odstopiti od te namire, pravzaprav smo želeli že konec lanskega leta, oziroma v drugi polovici lanskega leta, organizirati ta simpozij, vendar nam je bil nemogočen zaradi znanih razmir COVID-a. No, 
mislim pa, da smo se prav v tem času že zelo prilagodili videokonferenčnemu sistemu izmenjave mnen, izmenjave raziskav, izmenjave pogledov, ki jih imamo raziskovalci pri našem raziskovalnem delu. Tako da še enkrat lepo pozdravljeni, bom zaprosil Žigo, da bo nakratko v angleščini povzel. Predvsem pa se veselim objav, ki bodo nastali na podlagi tega simpozija oziroma zbranih prispevkov, zbranih raziskav, izvirnih raziskovalnih člankov, ki bodo obogatili zopet našo revijo Akta Histrije in upam, da se bomo s tem skupaj lahko še bolj uveljavljali v mednarodnem prostoru z našimi raziskavami in predvsem seveda z prikazom specifik, specifik torej slovenskega prostora. Prosim, Žiga. Darko, dir Darko, thank you for this introductory speech. I will really, really keep it short because I was not taking minutes when you were speaking. So, welcome everyone to the conference Cultural Memory. Uh, nation build, nation and state building of Slovenia, of nation and state building, um, Slovenia and Europe, which is part of the project Cultural Memory of Slovene Nation and State Building. Uh, and Professor Darowitz is, of course, the principal investigator of this project, and hence his welcoming speech. Um, initially, we were expecting a bit more uh, foreign lecturers, but things got in the way, especially COVID-19 uh, and even the digi digitization of the conference did not really help because it actually facilitated many more and more and more uh, online conferences and it's really hard to keep up with all of them. So we completely understand everybody that could not uh, come and attend this conference. Um, what else to say? Mm, we are definitely expecting uh, more output uh, in the form of science papers to be published in the Acta Istria journal in the in two special theme issues. One is due to be uh, published at least online uh, in a couple of weeks and the other one will be out in, uh, in early autumn. So there's still time, you can still prepare your papers until September. <clears throat> now I see that somebody has joined us, but there is no name next to the camera. Um, all right. Mm, got a bit lost there. S sorry about that. Um, so that you don't have to listen to me rant on and on. I would really uh, suggest that we take a short break so that lecturers and maybe uh, people from the audience from outside Slovenia who would probably only join for the actual conference, not for the opening speeches, uh, may join in on time. Tore Darko, če se strinjaš, bi jaz predlagal, da vseeno kakšnih 15-20 minut, če počakamo, mogoče, da se še kdo pridruži iz Tujine, ki verjetno ni imel nobenega namena poslušati teh uvodnih besed. Ja, hvala Žega za povzetek, se strinjam. Smo pričakovali očitno malo daljše vodne nagovore, 
si za to vzeli čas, ampak smo vzpostavili vezo, kontakt in predlagam, kot je rekel Žiga, da potem po programu pričnemo ob 9.45, med tem si vzamemo še malce pauze in da ne bi seveda nekateri, ki želijo poslušati posamezne referente, zgrešili ure, torej, da se držimo napovedanega razporeda. Ja, hvala, Darko. Se bom jaz tukaj dežuro, tudi, če bi se kdo bom jaz vklopil. Prosim, ja.
Uh, hello, Professor Costa. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes. hear me? Yeah, I can hear I'm you. I'm sorry. Uh, I was yeah completely mixed up. Yeah, it happens. It happens. It's not a problem. That's why I wrote the email just to yes. check up. Good, um, good thing you did. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're used to these kind of things. So. Yeah. So it starts in uh, four minutes. Yeah, in four minutes or so. So. Yeah, I. I well, I did prepare some uh, a, a small uh, PowerPoint, uh, but only with some uh, um, quotes actually. So, so I could I could skip it or I could keep it, whatever you think is best. Um, either way, whichever suits you better, I guess. If it's quotes, then maybe it's better for the audience to see them online. Okay. But, but um, yeah. So they can read them. Um, so uh, you have to make me a um, co-host then or? No, no, no. You just upload with the uh, next to the mic uh, to the right of the icon for the microphone. You have an open share tray. Can you see it? It's a small. Uh, ah, what's it called? What? Arrow. Arrow. Yeah. Arrow Thank you. Pointing up. It's an arrow pointing up. Uh, yeah. To the right of the microphone mm -hmm. uh, icon. You just click that and. and then you choose the window. Uh, if you have on the PowerPoint presentation program, you choose the PowerPoint. Yeah, you have to open the PowerPoint. That's good. First. And yeah. now just uh, slide, uh, turn on slideshow. Mm hmm. <coughs> Do you see it now? Yes. Yeah, we, we can see it. We can okay. see it. Uh, can you minimize the uh, right bottom uh, window? Uh, minimize, only minimize in the right. The, the window is yeah, yeah, here, here. Thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. That went very smoothly, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So now you only see, see my PowerPoint. You don't see me or. I can see you below where the other uh, okay. attendees are. So where you can see my ugly mug probably down there. I, don't, so, I only see my own PowerPoint, nothing else. Ah, no problem. We can see you. OK. OK. Um, so of course you will correct me how I pronounce your name. Um, yeah, it's Paul like in Paul McCartney and uh -huh. Colstow. Doesn't uh -huh. matter really. Doesn't matter really. <laughs> okay. I thought about your first name, but I wasn't quite sure about the, the surname. Yeah. That's all right. Mm. All right. I will slowly begin this uh, panel. Mm -hmm. I'll just wait for the exact minute. Maybe somebody else uh, logs on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Tako, lepo pozdravljeni še formalno v mojem imenu in dobrodošli oziroma dobrodošli nazaj v uvodni sklop naslovljen Kultura spominjanja, gradniki nacije ali naroda in mitotvorstvo. But since the papers on this panel will be in English, I will also moderate in English or at least some approximation of it. So uh, good morning to everyone in attendance. It's already a hot day outside here in Maribor, nearing 30 degrees Celsius, and thus perhaps much better suited to keep indoors and enjoy this conference. To facilitate a smooth run of, of the conference, I would uh, also like to ask all lecturers to try, at least try, uh, and keep your papers under 25 or 25-ish minutes. <clears throat> Nobody will be cut off just to facilitate a smoother run of things. We begin the actual part of the conference with a panel 
cultural memory, nation building and myth making. The first paper is cultural memory as both contributor and impediment to nation building by Paul Kolsta, who is professor of Russian studies at the University of Oslo, which is in Norway. If <clears throat> And uh, his main research areas are nationalism, ethnic conflict and, na and nation building, especially in Russia, the, the former Soviet Union and the Western Balkans. He is the recipient of six large grants to study nation building and ethnic relations in these regions, among them the well-known strategies of symbolic nation building in West Balkan states that ran from 2011 to 14. Currently, he's principal investigator of the project values-based regime legitimation in Russia, led by the University of Oslo. He has authored eight monographs, both in English and Norwegian, edited eight more, and published well over a hundred papers and monograph chapters in several languages. Among these, the monographs strategies of symbolic nation building in southeastern Europe and media discourse and the Yugoslav conflicts, both of which he edited, are perhaps best known to most present here today. As a lot of his works deal specifically with the issues addressed by our project and conference, I believe that he is certainly one of the best suited lecturers to open our conference. So, Professor Kotsta, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, glad to have you on board. Um, the screen is yours, please. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pity we could not come together in Maribor. Uh, I would very much have wanted to, to, to go to Slovenia. I've been to... Um, in former Yugoslavia a uh, number of times, and I actually lived in Hvar in, uh, in Croatia for uh, nine months together with my family when I worked on the, my West Balkan project. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit disorganized, so I th I thought I was supposed to be on tomorrow, but, but I, I, I have um, um, my paper ready, uh, and... Uh, um, so uh, here we go. So it's uh, on, um, yeah, uh, cultural memory as both a contributor and impediment to nation building. And I start by pointing out that collective or cultural memory has become an imp important field of research. And strictly speaking, the concept of memory is here used metaphorically as only individuals can have consciousness. However, human beings develop their consciousness in interaction with other members of society through upbringing in the family, schooling, exposure to mass media, and so on. Certain institutionalized narratives about society, including its past, are transmitted and forged into a collective memory. According to many uh, social scientists, an important quality of collective memory is its ability to contribute to social cohesion. And, uh, Jan Asman and John Chablitka, for instance, define cultural memory as, I quote, that body of reusable texts, images, and rituals specific to each society in each epoch, which, uh, um, upon which each group bases its awareness of unity and particularity. And several scholars have used this perspective to explain the phenomenon of nation building and national cohesion. For instance, the leading theoretician of nationalism, Anthony Smith, in his book, Myths and Memories of the Nation, argues that all nations need collective memories and traditions in order to flourish. And new states that lack unifying myths and memories have to invent them or forge them. However, many scholars, including Asman and Smith, in fact, also maintain that strong collective memories may also represent a serious impediment to national consoli uh, consolidation. Asman, for instance, knows that, I quote, culture does not by, all, by any means always work as an integrating, unifying force. 
it can also stratify and separate to at least the same degree. And much of the same thing is uh, Anthony Smith points out. In this paper, I will then examine how the role of historical memories and myths in nation building is treated in nationalism literature. And I, in the longer version, I also discuss it, how it is treated in uh, the tradition of collective memory and, and cultural memory, but in, in um, to save time, I will skip that part in you. So I can only give you a few examples actually of, of some uh, thinkers and uh, theoreticians who have been discussing this. And I start with some classical texts by um, early theorists of nationalism who were in a sense also themselves nationalists, meaning um, eight, uh, 19th century uh, uh, authors like John Stuart Mill and Ernest Renan. Uh, Mill uh, defined a nation or nationality, as he called it, as a portion of mankind, um, I, I quote, united among themselves by common sympathies that do not always exist between them and others which make them cooperate with each other more willing than, willingly than with other people, desire to be under the same government and desire that it should be governed by themselves. This feeling of nationality may have various sources, he points out, such as race, descent, common language or religion, but he explains the most important of all are common collective memories. The strongest of all is identity of political antecedents, the possession of a national history and a consequent community of recollections, collective pride and humiliation, pleasure and regret connected with the same incidents in the past. However, even if Mill perceptively focused on the importance of collective memories for identity building, he ignored the problems which such memories could create. He assumed that when several nationalities were included in the same state, the smaller ones would gradually become amalgamated with the larger ones, provided that they were governed by what is a tolerable justice. And when the members of the more powerful nationality were not made odious to them by being invested with exclusive privileges. This kind of Voluntary assimilation was underway in Great Britain, he believed, with the possible exception of the Irish. And Mill admitted that the Irish had been atrociously governed, but luckily that was now a thing of the past. And I quote, there is no, now next to nothing except the memory of the past and the differences in the predominant religion to keep apart two races perhaps more fitted than any other two in the world to be completing counterparts of, of one another. But when Mill wrote this, he had apparently forgotten that he only a few pages earlier had singled out collective pride and humiliation as the strongest of all factors in the creation of nationality. And today we know that the humiliation and the regrets felt by the Irish people at his time and earlier were sufficient to stoke an independent struggle, which eventually led them to secede from Great Britain. So let's move on to, to Ernest Gellner. In his famous, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> Ernest, uh, Ernest Renan, uh, in his um, uh, famous speech, uh, What is a Nation? He is he, another early theoretician of nationalism. Like Mill, he focused on common memories as a major ingredient in nationalism identity. He believed he, he delivered his speech 12 years after the French-German War in 1870, when the basically Germanophone um, region of Alsace-Lorraine had been captured by Germany. And German claims to these disputed areas were grounded in an understanding of nationhood as based on race or ethnicity, while uh, Renan insisted that it should be built upon voluntary association. 
and the German speaking uh, uh, Alsace and Lorraine identified with France and not with Germany, he pointed out. Therefore, with regard to national identity, more valuable by far than common customs, posts, and frontiers conforming to strategic ideas is the fact of sharing in the past a glorious heritage and regrets, and of having in the future a shared program to put into effect, or the fact of having suffered, enjoyed, and hoped together. These are the kinds of things that can be understood in spite of differences of race and religion, uh, race and language. I quote, uh, and quote. However, Rena indirectly admitted that collective memories do not always unite people. They may also tear them apart. Therefore, he insisted that the nation must be built not only on collective memories, but also on collective amnesia. That is, deliberate forgetting of those historical events that undermine national unity. And I quote again, forgetting, I would even go as far as to say, historical error is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation, which is why progress in historical studies often constitutes a danger for the principle of nationality. Indeed, historical inquiry brings to light deeds of violence which took place at the origin of all political formations, even of those whose consequences have been altogether beneficial. Unity is always affected by means of brutality. To my mind, this statement is remarkable, not only for its cynicism, but also for its naivete. Renan was speaking at a time when history was being established as a serious scholarly discipline, and to believe that the results of serious historical studies could be kept from the population in order to dupe them into becoming members of a national community they otherwise would have rejected, must, in my uh, view, be regarded as wishful thinking. And this is even truer today in our information society, when every single inconvenient truth will come to light sooner or later. And while it is possible to suppress written history, it is psychologically impossible to say, from now on, we will no longer remember. It is psychologically impossible. If we move on to our own, uh, to, to the 20th century, we can note that um, many scholars uh, of, uh, and experts on nationalism um, did not pay much attention to, to the role of um, uh, cultural memory, or collective memory, such as the most uh, modernists like Ernest Gellner, John Burley, Paul Brass, and others. Uh, they focused on very different uh, aspects of how nation and nationalism um, developed. So in order to find someone who paid a lot of attention to this, uh, I, I think we had to turn to, to ethno-symbolism, and it's particularly its leading exponent, uh, Anthony Smith, for a thorough discussion of, among modern nationalism scholars on the role of collective memory in the development of national identity. In his polemics against uh, these, the people I, I just mentioned, Smith argued that nations are indeed modern phenomena, as they uh, also believe. So he, he agreed with them on that point, but he claimed that they do have deep historical roots in earlier ethnic culture. And this ethnic culture is the raw material of the nation, so to speak, and much of the specific examination in Smith's book is concerned with how this proto-national culture is molded and reshaped into modern national culture. Smith defined a nation as, I quote, a name, named use, uh, human population sharing a historical territory, common myths and historical me memories, a myth mass public uh, culture, a common uh, economy and common legal rights and duties for all members. This means that historical myths and memories constitute an integrated part of his definition of what a nation is. And therefore, um, 
it uh, comes as no surprise when he, that he returns to this uh, to these uh, myths and memories time and again. For instance, in his book uh, *The Ethnic Origin of Nations*, uh, he um, uh, writes that even for the most recent created states, ethnic homogeneity and cultural unity are paramount considerations. Even where their societies are genuinely plural, and there is no, there is an ideological commitment to pluralism and cultural toleration. The elites of the new states find themselves compelled by their own ideals and the logic of the ethnic situation to forge new myths and symbols for their em em emergent nations. Further on uh, in um, his book, uh, Myths and Memories, um, he, of the nation, he, he, which he regards as the brick and mortar of nations, he admitted that uh, these myths and memories can also be dynamite that shatters the nation uh, by engendering uncontrollable emotions. Uh, yeah, I think we skipped that. <laughs> I have skipped it. So here, here we come. Um, he says that myths and memories are not simply instruments of leaders and elites of the day, uh, not even of whole communities. They are potent signs and explanation. They have capacity for generating emotions in successive generations. They possess explosive power that goes far beyond the rational uses which elites and social scientists deem appropriate. Evoking an historic past is like playing with fire, as the history of all too many ethnic and nations locked in conflict today can tell. But this is from 1986, uh, and Smith was writing just before the outbreak of wars in former Yugoslavia. But in retrospect, we can see that what uh, he described here conformed quite closely to what many observers have later identified as uh, one of the major drivers behind these wars. The breakup of Yugoslavia has become a paradigm of the deleterious effects of historical myths and cultural memories. Now, in later works, uh, Smith downplayed the disruptive energy of collective memories and emphasized the necessity of nation building in all states. At the same time, he underlined more strongly than before, the mythical or non-factual character of na national myths. Nations need to believe that they have a common ethnic origin, but he asked, referring not only to new states, but to all states, also established European nation states, he asks, were, was there ever a unified national identity except in the dreams of the ethnic nationalists? In um, a, a later book uh, from 1995 called Nations and Nationalism in a Global Era, Smith then pr uh, proceeded to apply his theory to myths, myths and collective memories uh, in the Europe and, and in order to pull apart a, uh, the European identity project pursued by many Euro European uh, or EU leaders and ideologists. And then he, he debunked one after another various possible sources of myths and collective memories as possible foundations for a building of European identity, such as the, the common Greece uh, Roman heritage, Roman law, the civilization of Christ, uh, Christendom, the Judeo Christian system of values, and so on and so forth. For good measure, he also threw in. Europe, Europe's white imperialist tradition, as if any um, uh, serious politicians would take recourse to that today. So any attempt to impart warmth and life to a European identity, Hinko concluded, would mean dredging up memories best left alone, memories of war, of expulsion, massacres by and of people of Europe left 
allow outsiders. I'm almost certain that if uh, Anthony Smith had lived uh, today, he would have been uh, a strong proponent of uh, supporter of Brexit. But my point here is that while there are no doubt myriads of horror stories in the European history closet, to focus so solely on them and to ignore the monuments, mo the, the moments of collaboration and triumph in European history would be just as one-sided and artificial as to, to create uplifting historical myths and cultivations of his uh, cohesive collective memories of nation building as he often did. So myths broadside against European project, in my view, can be used also as an arsenal of arguments against the ethnically based nation state, which he regarded as inevitable in the modern world. So where does this leave us? Uh, is it so that cultural memories of the nations are in fact inherently divisive and counterproductive in nation building? Uh, should the nation builders try to focus on those cultural memories that can unite the, the country's various ethnic communities and ignore and even su suppress the controversial ones? And is that at all possible in today's modern world with mass communication and internet? In my view, the main reason why theories of group cohesion are not readily applicable to nation building is that very few states, perhaps Slovenia, but that will be an exception, uh, can be regarded as a group, one group in, in the singular. They are conglomerates of diverse, overlapping and sometimes antagonistic groups with different identities, interests and collective memories. The memory problem becomes particularly acute when the various groups are not only do not only relate to different events in the past, but also remember the same events with radically different evaluations. One group's victory can be another's defeat. Atrocities suffered by one part of the nation may be committed by another group within the same population. And the national antagonisms do not have to be based on ethnicity. Also, other identity uh, groups may be uh, drawn into conflict by, by uh, contested pasts. For instance, even in an ethnically and very homogenous nation as like Slovenia today, some segments of the population may nourish nostalgia for Titoism, while others preserve the memory of the, the, the Tito's wartime adversaries, the fascist Domobranze. So um, if the notion of national unifying national memory embraced by all members of society can no longer be upheld. Is it still possible that collective memories may contribute to nation level societal cohesion? Or is there at least not represent insurmountable impediments to it? I, I have uh, tried hard to find in the literature uh, some discussions of this and I have I did find some but I will now present only the one which I felt was perhaps the most convincing to my view. And that is uh, Anthony Smith's uh, student, John Hutchinson, uh, who has developed his uh, uh, teacher's ethno-symbolic approach to nationalism. Uh, and um, in his book, which he significantly calls nations as zones of conflict. So he admits that they are the nations are built in a sense on conflict. So um, he, he points out that many established national states in the modern world have experienced an explosion of deep seated cultural conflict, conflicts that to some degree can be explained by different historical memories and the interpretations of the past held by various groups in society. As an example, he uh, points to, to antagonistic traditions in France between Republicans and Catholics, and in Russia between Slavophiles and Westernizers. So why he believes that we must acknowledge the independent power of divergent memories in society 
in an interesting twist, it indicates that this power need not be destructive. It can also be a source of strength and cohesion. I quote, alternative, uh, uh, sorry, uh, alternations between rival moments can mobilize different social energies by which to overcome crisis, thereby strengthening the nation as it navigates the many challenges, political, economic, military, and ideological in the modern world. In fact, no ethnic communi uh, community or modern nation could survive, he believes, uh, without, unless it contains a plurality of traditions. So, um, as a, but he also admits that uh, these uh, social and ideological cleavages in the nation may be too deep and contestation be between them not necessarily benign. It can also produce polarization of uh, options, a diversion of public energies into symbolic issues that should have gone into economic and social development. But at least uh, I believe he is correct when he says that um, uh, um, healthy, <laughs> if you can use that as a word, uh, nation uh, will um, normally contain a plurality of traditions, not only one uh, imposed from above. I stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Costa. Uh, thank you for this insightful overview. Uh, I'm certain that the audience now has a clearer idea of the theories, ideas, and central themes addressed by this conference. Uh, I will use my moderator status to ask just a brief question and just provide a brief comment, um, not completely uh, in sync with your uh, lecture, but nonetheless part of it. Uh, during my research in this project, I have come across the, the fact that both Norway and Slovenia, then in both Norway and Slovenia, uh, it was the peasants, uh, which were made the only or main carriers of national culture, history and memory uh, by 19th century uh, national or nationalist activists, and for similar reasons, due to a lack or very little nobility, foreign, in quotation marks, bourgeoisie and uh, similar reasons. Uh, so far, my observation, but my question would be, if you can even, uh, I mean, if it even tackles your research, um, what do you think are the common things, the things in common in uh, nation and state building between, on the one side, renewed or newer states like Norway and Finland, what do they share with, for example, West Balkan states in nation and state building? And what is it that divides them uh, the most, apart from the armed ethnic conflict? Mm. Well, <laughs> uh, I have not had much time to, to think about uh, this, but uh, and I'm not, I'm a Norwegian, but I'm not an expert on Norwegian history. But uh, I, I, I uh, would say that. You're partly correct when you focus on the peasants as sort of the main building block in nation building in Norway. But but the peasants are the raw material, I would say, not 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 the architects of the nation building. They will always be the 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 elites, the intellectuals, the intelligentsia, who are though those who, who forge the nation but they focused and you, that's quite correct from what you said on the peasants as uh, the, the nation uh, but the the peasants themselves uh, were were to a large degree illiterate but um, and but the the uh, people in, in the urbanites the people in, in the, the towns and the, the few cities we had uh, they, they idealized uh, the peasants and so saw that the, the, the peasants as the nation and wanted to, to become a part uh, of the nation. Uh, so so um, 
and um, and of course, nationalism el everywhere uh, is a, 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 an ideology which uh, foc has to focus on, on the uh, the common man in order uh, to to. Um, to create national unity and to, to, to see uh, the, the vertical links between the elite and, and the, the masses. Uh, so, and I guess the fact that the, uh, the masses were uh, so, um, demographically predominant in uh, our society in Northern Europe, in the Scandinavia and in the Western Balkans, uh, means that the the, um, the peasants uh, were so, became so, so so important focus on the nation building projects, um, but uh, yeah, but is yeah, that they were <laughs> instrumentalized actually mm -hmm. by national activists. Pardon um, me. The peasants were instrumentalized by nationalist activists as this. Yes, but. Uh, yes. I was just uh, I was just mm -hmm. uh, one minute. I'm sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but uh, yeah. the IT uh, asked me to ask you to close your PowerPoint presentation so we can oh, see I, you. I'm not done. Oh, sorry. Uh, is it is it done? Or? Yeah, this this is it. This is it. No, Thank no, you. no. No, no. I opened it, but uh, it's all right. I would just ask. Uh, my dear colleague Polona Tratnik to uh, close her camera. Thank you. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, uh, we, we have a, um, what is, I guess, is um, peculiar again to, to Norwegian understanding of the nation is that uh, not only are, is there a lot of focus on, on uh, the peasants or, or the, the and I would include the, the fishermen uh, with the, the the people along the, the coast were more engaged in, in fishery than, than in, in agriculture by the way but we also have very strong um, um, regional identities uh, and you can say that the people identify Often more with that region than with the nation, but also my point here is that um, there is no contradiction between it, it having a strong regional identity and a national identity. Uh, so, so that they go together, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah. So, so that is one of the pecu peculiarities, I believe, of Norwegian uh, national identity idea. But uh, to what? It, uh, I guess I don't know about Slovenia. I think you you are not perhaps not a, a large enough country to have a strong regional identity. What? Well, I, actually, we have, and they are there you go, quite there severe you go. sometimes. Yeah, but okay, but there we, you go. Yeah, yeah, we do. But again, uh, then uh, to 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 in in like what uh, John Hutchins Hutchins said that you can have the. Uh, the different uh, ideological uh, 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 currents in the nation, and you can still uh, feel attached to the same nation, and you bring your your voice to, to the common nation building project. But in the same way, you can have this territorial the, uh, diversification of regions, which all contri contribute with their part to, to the common nation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would now like to ask the and invite the audience to ask their questions, but please keep it somewhat brief. Thank you. Can I have a question, Giga, Polona? Of so. course, of course. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, um, uh, hi, good day, uh, uh, Professor Parkosta. Um, I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, I would like to congratulate you on your contributions. Um, 
I think they're very important. Uh, here I have this book, Strategi Strategies of Symbolic Nation Building in Southeastern Europe. I just regret that there is uh, no count on Slovenian case. <laughs> so perhaps another project would um, allow also some contributions to enlighten Slovenian um, cases. I would like actually to comment, um, here you differentiate between Okay, the notion of nation building on the one hand and state building on the other hand, but you also are aware of the difference between the notion the notion of nation in the West, as uh, you mentioned Renan today, so related to the formation of state and uh, not related to the to the uh, ethnic or um, uh, origin. Uh, while on the other hand, you know that the, there is this notion of narod, uh, which is also in Slovenian a term for the nation. Um, here you identify the notion nation building as you say, those are strategies of identity consolidation within states. And you distinguish it from state building. So uh, they, you say these are state initiated identity building strategies. Well, if you consider nation as narod, as you say, in our region, this is relevant. Uh, for instance, in the case of Slovenia, you would have several um, cases and uh, some periods where there was very strong nation building process but not a state initiated process because mm. we were part of another state, for instance, Yugoslavia or even before in other political um, um, uh, formations. While we were, we identified ourselves as Slovenians, so as the narod. So I would still call that nation building processes. While, for instance, in the 80s, we were using popular culture, uh, advertising different uh, or other. Uh, elements of uh, culture for uh, soft, so-called soft uh, nation formation. Uh, in the end, that resulted in the independence of Slovenia, of course. But um, wouldn't you call that nation building process uh, still? Well, um, there are many things here. First, why was not Slovenia included in, in the book? Uh, and that is uh, for, for a very practical reason. Uh, we got a, a grant from the Norwegian Research Council to study uh, nation building in the Western Balkans. What is the Western Balkans? Well, in EU uh, terms and also in, in the Norwegian system, uh, it is, you cannot be, um, uh, you're not part of the Western Balkans if uh, you are an EU member. Uh, so it was excluded on, on that uh, basis. Uh, and I think the the uh, uh, Slovenians can live with with that. <laughs> uh, you don't necessarily. Uh, you you're happy to be a EU member. I believe you're one of the success stories within the in, in the EU. And and by the way, uh, the Balkans is a sort of a, a negative word. It has negative connotation for, for many many people. Also for people living there. Now to to um, and and that, then the concept of NATO or in Russian Narod, um, I believe it is the same in the the West Balkan languages as in in Russia. That it, it is it ambiguous. It can mean uh, uh, the um, uh, po total population of the state, but it can also be the the uh, the people as this uh, in contradistinction to the elite, right? Uh, so, so like the Russian uh, Narodniki. Uh, that they were not focusing on, on the entire Russian uh, people, but on the, the, the simple people, the, the common people, uh, and so, so and that, which is a, sort of can lead to, to um, uh, ambiguities and, and even misunderstandings and, and confusion. Now, um, I, in um, an earlier project I had, uh, where we compared nation building and uh, ethnic conflict in Moldova and Estonia. Uh, I con collaborated with a very good uh, ethnic um, researcher. Um, and uh, uh, I, I said, we, we should look at nation building in Estonia. And I, to, I used that uh, term nation building in the way you just um, uh, quoted me on. 
as to, to a top-down strategy to, to create a common identity among the entire population in the country, meaning in Estonia, where you had both Estonians and a large um, population of Russians. But, but he, he said, but uh, the nation building in Estonia was completed in the 19th century. So he used the term nation building in a very, very different sense. And if, if he meant that, in, in the political consequences of that is that the Russians were not part of the Estonian nation. His uh, um, usage of that term meant that the, the Russians were um, automatically excluded from the nation. Well, I, I wanted to, to look at strategies to inc include them. So what he, my Estonian, very good friend and Estonian colleague called Estonian nation building, I, in order to, to avoid confusion, I would consistently say Estonian ethnic consolidation. So, but, but this uh, ambiguity continues to the, this day because the, the terms are used in different ways. And finally, uh, to the point of nation building versus state building. And in the book, uh, which you referred to, uh, we found, to our surprise, that we found very little um, um, uh, connectivity here. Uh, the uh, one of the um, states, uh, two of the states, which was had a very bad score on state building, meaning uh, on the building infrastructure, economy, uh, and so on, were uh, Kosovo uh, and Albania, and they scored very high on on uh, nation building in the sense that they had a high uh, support among the, pop the the people we surveyed in with our opinion poll uh, of support for the state uh, and for the nation. Uh, so you can have a, a strong national identity. We we found maybe maybe we cannot generalize this from this our find findings, but we found no hardly any connection at all between those two aspects, and therefore. Uh, uh, I, th I think it is worth keeping those two things apart an analytically. Uh, and it, but it's very confusing when Americans talk, we should not do a nation building in Afghanistan, they are talking about something very different again. So we have to, to, to sort of define the terms before we start using them. Mm. Sure, thank you. It's not, uh, you mentioned Russia, it's not only class related, but for instance, in the ex Yugoslavia, we would have two sorts of processes. One would be nation building in the sense that there would really top down process initiated by the state that would be Yugoslav nation building. And then on the other hand, you would have this Narod building, so to say. We also differentiate the words Narod and Nazia. So the Nazia is rather political term, and Narod is this um, ethnic, re ethnic related. So, and that you would have this Slovenian nation, so to say, building. But don't you think that the Tito and his, his um, uh, the, the ideologist in his party would, would use the term Yugoslavinsky Narod? No, not Narod. That would be Nazia. Okay. 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 <laughs> well, again, right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kostov. Thank you, Professor Tratnik. Uh, sorry, I have to intervene here uh, and let other lecturers uh, speak. Mm. My thanks again for your contribution. Please uh, stay with us at least until the end of this panel. If somebody has questions, we can reschedule them to the end of this panel. <clears throat> uh, but now, um, and Professor Kosta, if you can please uh, turn out your uh, camera. Just the camera. The little camera icon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now moving on to two papers uh, on myth making and nation building, focusing on its powerful integrative symbols of folk or national heroes. First, the paper Slovenia or Slovin Nation Building Mythmaker, Fran Leustix Martin Kerpan by Darko Darovec. Darko Darovec is professor of modern history at the University of Maribor, professor of history at the new university in Ljubljana, director of the Iris Institute, and principal investigator 
in the project Cultural Memory of Slovene Nation and State Building. His main research areas are the history of conflict resolution and dispute settlement, the history of the Northern Adriatic and cultural memory and many, many more. He was the <clears throat> sorry, he was the principal investigator of the Marie Curie Actions Project FIDA that ran from 2015 to 17 and other international and national projects and is currently also involved in the national project Social Functions of Fairy Tales uh, led by Professor Tratnik, whom you have seen uh, a few minutes ago. Professor Darovitz is the editor in chief of the journals Acta Histria, Annales Series Historia et Sociologia, and Series Historia Naturalis, and has authored 16 science monographs in several languages, as well as over 100 papers in, and monograph chapters. Not to prolong this presentation, uh, dear Darko, beseda i tvoja. Žiga, uh, hvala za to prezentacijo. I thank to Žiga for this presentation. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank to Professor Kolsto. First, he joined us at this conference and uh, I sincerely hope that we will continue our cooperation in these common topics. I hope I hope also that my contribution and of other part participants will, at least in a certain part and in a concrete case, complement the starting points of Professor Kolsto. I, now I would like to share my, my presentation that I must first found, find. Uh, OK, I hope that it is here. You can see my presentation. Yeah, we can see it. OK, thank you. Well, this paper will reveal how smuggling and peasant revolts and their historiographical traditions influenced the emergence of a literary tale that over time has been transformed into a national myth with which the Slovenian people have identified since its emergence in the mid 19th century. As indicating, I'm referring to literary tale Martin Karpan's Vrha by the Slovenian writer Fran Leustik first published in 1958. The intention of this paper is to put forward a complex interpretation of this literary work that still steers the imagination 40 years after the creation of the independent Slovenian state and event that also included revolt as one of its constitutive elements. However, my intention is to discuss how Slovenian writers participated in the nation building process during the second half of the 19th century. An analysis of uh, Leustik's Martin Karpan reveals a unique phenomenon that was tailored to a specific program, namely the conscious desire to create a national literary character that would constitu constitute both a, a foundation for further literary creation and for the national political struggle. Leo Stick was only 27 years old when in the same year, 1958, published in the literary form his literary political program program rambling from Letia to Chatesh, which is known to all Slovenian public. Uh, then a critical essay entitled Mistakes in Slovenian Writings and the literary tale Martin Karpan, which served as a model for the realization of 
his ideas. But only 20 page, pages long, this lively text presents Martin Karpan, a Slovenian peasant, as the central character whose role is to save the emperor in Vienna and indeed the entire, entire empire and religion from the Ottoman, so Islamic treat. This is also the central heroic did in the tale. What must be emphasized here is Leustig's cautious choice of main character, a peasant, a social rebel, a smuggler, a writer's avenger, and at the same time, a savior of the community against the danger of the other. These choices were crucial in creating a character with whom the Slovenian nation in formation could identify. The portrayal of the hero character shows that specific qualities of the Slovenian nation in formation. It lacked not only its own centers of power, but also nobility, bourgeois, official authorities, and until the mid 19th century, suitable schools in the area where its ethnic community lived, there were only a few small circulation newspapers published in Slovenia. Slovenians are said to belong to those nations of, of people that were founded on culture and language, rather than on a glorious past of kings and military rulers. Slovenian intellectuals only began to assert themselves during the mid 19th century. This process was accelerated by the education of young people moving from rural to urban areas, as was also the case with Leustig. As a distinctive factor, language already has a considerable influence on the formation of individual communities in the pre-national era, era. However, in the period when nation states were in formation, language became one of the most important, if not the most important element of unification. In this period, various national mythologies were created and presented as advanced ideas. The humanistic sciences also entered the fray competing for which one of them would be most effective in establishing national symbols and mythologies. Recently, how demonstrated also dear Professor Kolsto, researchers have begun to dedicate considerable attention to these issues. For example, Smith in Myth and Memories defined the four main categories of originating national myths. Primordial, so original, perennial, and eternal, modernists as a result of the process of modernization, and ethno-symbolic. Colesto, in the introduction of his collection of scientific papers about myths and borders in southern Europe, notes that specific forms of national mythologies appeared more in this region than elsewhere in Europe because of the many borders and bordering countries. He divides originating myths into the following four categories, sui generis, ante morale, martyrium, and antiquitas. However, if we apply these classifications and the description of the manifestations of national mythologies and contemporary scientific literature to Martin Karpan, we encounter a problem. Which category of or categories does Leustig's tale belong to? The pivotal event of the story, the duel, suggests that this work belongs primarily to the category of anti-morale myths. And yet the entirety of Leustig's tales is also rich in ethno-symbolic traditions. 
its mythical narrative attractive to both preschool children and top level academics establishes a lack of temporal commitment, an autonomy and openness related to meaning, which is a de facto characteristic and condition of every, every durable and resistant literary work. It is also successful with the use of metaphors and symbols in establishing a unique combination of individual categories within the national myths. The lack of temporal commitment creates an impression of originality and eternity in terms of the hero's national economic activity on the selected ethnic territory. The duel as the court and its outcome contains unambiguous associations to ideas about the victimized rule of the Slovenian nation at the hands of the Ottomans, so Islam, something, something that was still very much present in the cultural memory of the com community. With the elevation of the peasant class to the career of bourgeois transformation, the tale predicts the unique or chosen rule of the people, sui generis. But the primary purpose and mission of this literary tale, as imagined and theoretically justified by the author, was modernistic. This is the main reason its seat fell on fertile ground. But we should be also aware that the Kirpan's success, success of this tale, among Slovenians was not instant or spontaneous. The story slowly gained popularity. Certainly the story became better known when it was reproduced in a textbook, textbook for colleges in 1968. Since then, it has been a part of the canon of youth literature. It was also reprinted uh, many times and uh, the first time it was also reprinted with illustrations by Hinko Smrekar and then in the 1954 by uh, Tone Kral, which uh, was uh, to say the, the perhaps the, the best illustration of this tale, which brings also this mythology of, of the same tale at the um, very high level of the illustration, which is also demonstrated in my illustrations, in my presentation. I will not read all my <laughs> paper because it would be too much long. But uh, I would like to stress uh, the, the meaning uh, which was in the front of the author of this uh, literary tale, that is to bring together the history events uh, with the uh, actually political programs of that time. That was no doubt the, the first political program, Slovenian, so-called Zedinina Slovenia, United Slovenia, in the 1848, so in the in the year of the uh, European revol bourgeois revolutions. Then the first Slovenian politicians uh, grow up this political program. And it is perhaps uh, very interesting to hear those uh, argumentations. They said people should live in their own country as they as they please. Germans in German fashion, Italians in Italian fashion, Hungarians in Hungarian fashion, and we Slavs demand fiercely and with our power 
that others let us live in our country as we please, Slovenians in Slovenian fashion. And this was the, the, the first political needs of the uh, expressions of the uh, Slovenian people, of the Slovenian nation building uh, potentials. And I see this uh, uh, literary tale present in my paper of uh, Fran Leustik, uh, just as one of the uh, very important uh, meat buildings of the nation. But what it is uh, interesting of, from my point of view is also that the Leustic cautious choice of an outlaw hero, so of the smuggler, uh, is uh, no doubt made on the basis of his ethnographic field research. He's, he discovered, for example, that the historical rule of the hero smuggler, in this case of Salt, who enjoyed a degree of support from his community, was already very much present in Slovenian folk literature, which had only started to be writing during that period. In making his choice, his, he also took into consideration the folk literature from other southern countries, for example, uh, as we, we will see briefly in the continued uh, presentation, the much more uh, national or regional uh, outlaw heroes that are present in southeastern countries. But also the western countries was in the uh, interest of uh, our author uh, Leustik and his studies, other smugglers, uh, for example, what it seems, the French smuggler Man Mandren, uh, who was in the middle, in the 18th century, an um, important smuggler which had a band of more than 200 smugglers, and they demand social change. Uh, he he become a national hero, uh, f no doubt also in the, the process of state formation or in the process of the building of the bourgeois uh, society in uh, French countries and in other in other European countries. But he was an outlaw hero. So I uh, pass briefly. Uh, I, I would like just uh, to say a few words uh, about uh, brilliant, from my po point of view, brilliant work of Eric Hobsbawm, Bandits, um, where he present the, the characteristics of the outlaw legends. And he said that these uh, societies, human society, that lie between the face of tribal and kinship organization and modern capitalist and industrial society uh, invented the, uh, these uh, outlaw heroes as uh, myths of their communities. And they have uh, some uh, sets of guidelines, or we can say also the moral codes that are that they are characteristic for the outlaw heroes represented. We can say much more uh, in the legend, uh, for, for example, of the Robin Hood. So this is a social uh, rebel, the, the, the social uh, outlaw hero which must be also uh, uh, for first for, from the point of the moral codes, a friend of, to the poor, a trickster forced into outlawry, betrayed, oppressed. He must be brave, generous, courteous, 
not indulge and, uh, in unjustified violence and also live on after death. Uh, so here I present uh, other characteristics of the outlook heroes. Also, I, I will bring some analysis or interpretation of the characteristics of the uh, tales uh, represented by the Vladimir Prop, uh, one of the most important uh, researchers of the tales, and also I think uh, the uh, works of Claude Levi Strauss entered in our our um, interpretation with the with the uh, analyze, uh, analyze of myths uh, with uh, characteristics of uh, heroes in, in myths and in the tales. But it, uh, it appears that Franz Leustig invented this tale uh, 70 years before Prop's analysis of fairy tales and a hundred years before Levi Strauss analysis of myths on the basis of theoretical and methodological elements. Although the literary greatness of Martin Kerpan resides in part in its use of mythical procedures and in part in its uh, deconstruction of mythical ideology, the tale follows the rules of mythology. In fact, this was its primary pur purpose and will become clear in this discussion. The typical mythical process presents the solution to a problem that has emerged in society with dramatic anxiety or even traumatic urgency. The myth achieves this by actualizing the contradiction with a well-known domestic uh, unearthful contrast of relationship and resolving it with modest means also almost aesthetical. But Leustig's basic mythical problem was the Slovenian language, the Slovenian word. Uh, and this was the myth of the Martin Karpan, as I would like to present. Uh, one of the special charms of the tale or myth of Martin Karpan is that Leustig never published its second part, which remains virtually unknown to reading public. With the second part, he encompassed the rules mentioned above as well as the concepts of mythical tales. Nevertheless, or indeed perhaps precisely because of this lack, the myth was established. And I would like to conclude to say that the value of Leustig's tale resides in its merging of mythical and literary narrative into a functionally connected organism, the simultaneity of historical and non-historical elements and the interaction between symbolic and real ambiguities. Leustig's structure for both, for both, his literary political program and for his tale about Martin Kerpan originates from historical realities in the 15th and 16th centuries. Economic, transportation, social, peasant revolts and political history, defense against the Turks. Leustig combined these elements with the fundamentals of folkloric and ethno-symbolic cultural heritage of that period. In Martin Kerpan, Leustig skillfully conceals historical realities behind metaphors and symbolism, which is typical of myths. In this way, 
he provides a patch towards the realization of national political ambitions. But the real meat Leoste creates created was more than just Martin Kerpan and his adventures. It was more than an argument for the historical origin or vocation of a nation, the defense of the civilization, or the demand for political rights or mimetic narrative prose, i.e. the ability to create a virtual real world. The real meat, as we said, was the elevation of the Slovenian language to the essential distinguishing and constitutive element compared to others of the Slovenian nation building process. So, myths have always possessed an identificational and constitutive social role, even when it comes to the negative or positive consequences of the actions taken by people who identify themselves with myths. We cannot say that myths are not real or that are fictional and thus should be repudiated in some way. Myths exist. Their existence makes them real and active. Indeed, they provide an excellent method for historians, anthropologists and the global interdisciplinary studies about the past and the present to which these academics belongs because they help them to explore cultural memories, imaginaries, mentalities, perceptions, and social relations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Darko. Thank you for this tour of contribution. Um, on one of the probably best known national characters, national heroes, at least mythical national heroes in Slovenia. I had a question about outlaw heroes, but you already answered that in your presentations. So um, we have a bit of time for one short question from the audience and perhaps some more in the time reserved for the discussion. Now, if there is any question, please, uh, ask, uh, I would only ask Darko to keep a short reply as well. Thank you. Are there any questions? Huh, no one dares confront Martin Kirpan. Uh, all right. <clears throat> then I would like to continue with our next presentation which is a somewhat similar paper on another folk hero from, from another South Slavic setting, which I believe will make for good comparison, both in this South Slavic and the broader uh, spectrum. This paper uh, is trader Kanyos Macedonovic as a Montenegrin national myth, by Marian Premovic. Uh, Marian Premovic is Associate Professor of Medieval Studies and Vice Dean for Science and International Cooperation at the Faculty of Philosophy, University of Montenegro. In 2019, he was elected member of the History Committee at the Montenegrin Academy of Sciences and Arts. He has authored three monographs and over 70 science papers. Currently, he is involved in two cost action international projects, uh, Islamic Legacy and the other one is People in Motion, both of which uh, address various historical processes in the broader Mediterranean. Staff and students from the Maribor Department of History will remember his lectures at the Faculty of Arts in April 2019 and he has also closely cooperated with the University of Tuzla in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Dear Marian, thank you for joining us. Glad to have you at the conference. 
riječ je vaša. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, it is my pleasure uh, and honor to have the opportunity uh, to participate today's conference with topic uh, Trader Kanjos Macedonovic as a Montenegrin national meet. Uh, just let me interrupt you for a second. Can you please just click on the enlarge this thank you this is it thanks it okay okay uh, this this paper uh, aims uh, to show how the work of the pastrovici author uh, stepan mitrov ljubiša kanjos uh, macedonovic 1870 the uh, influence the emergence of artificial narrative uh, that has uh, development uh, into the nation, national uh, meet of the Pastorici tribe and, and Montenegrins. Uh, the purpose of this paper uh, is to encourage a more complex interpretation of this uh, story with uh, resist and uh, battle uh, as its element. Uh, the Slavic uh, population had bad memories uh, of the centuries-long Venetian rule, uh, 1423 uh, to 1797, uh, resulting uh, in the stronger uh, awakening and character uh, of Southern Dometia. Uh, in 1870, uh, Ljubiša wrote a story uh, about Kanjos Macedonovic, creating literary work in uh, line uh, with his program uh, aimed uh, at uh, shaping the language uh, into a symbolic toll uh, that will shape uh, the Montenegrin nation. Uh, Kanjos Macedonovic is fictional uh, historical uh, figure uh, inventing a new uh, hero past in the best way uh, to create the nation of nation uh, with the heroic monumental uh, idea. In the 19th century, uh, the literature was in several uh, of nation efforts uh, implying that its main characteristic uh, was ideological and political Instrument, instrumentalization in line with political developments in the second half of the 19th century. Lubisha create national and literary uh, figure that would uh, serve as the basic for uh, literary uh, creation and national struggle. Uh, the Pastrovici cover uh, a castle uh, area in Montenegro. Uh, between uh, Budva and Bar. Budva town, the bar is here on the map. Uh, in historical uh, source, uh, they are mentioned uh, for the first time in the mid uh, 14th century. In uh, 1423, uh, representative of the municipality uh, of Pastrovici concluded an agreement with Venetians recognizing uh, the uh, sovereignty and they become a part of it southern regions Venetian Albania. Uh, the Venetian guarantee uh, internal uh, self uh, government rights and borders. For uh, products from Pastrovici, uh, no castle uh, duties uh, would be charged in Venice or other Venetian regions. In uh, the uh, in it is historical uh, function uh, of uh, motif in tale of Kanjos Macedonovic, it is long uh, struggle of the Pastrovici uh, tribe uh, to trade 
uh, freely in Venetian uh, market, uh, free uh, from uh, duties. Uh, that is the reason uh, why uh, Ljubiša uh, choose the uh, a true rebel uh, trader as uh, constituent meat. Ljubiša use memory point uh, to general uh, relation in the past and present in a specific uh, social uh, cultural context. Uh, a cultural uh, of protecting the memory uh, from uh, oblivion uh, is very important as it shapes the identity uh, as well uh, as uh, attitude to history. The tale uh, show uh, Montenegro identity uh, throughout the interpretation uh, in the present. Uh, the story's uh, central event is dual with Jayan uh, Furlan. Uh, Kanjos Macedonovic uh, coincide with uh, Slovenian myth of Fran Lestvik, Martin uh, Krpan, and belongs to anti-moral uh, category. Uh, the myth from the past present the memory of uh, ancient times and explain the uh, present. Ljubiša uh, selection of Kanjos for the protagonist reflects uh, a specific attitude uh, toward the Montenegrin nation and the following are uh, identity uh, in him, trader, rebel, a fighter for Pashtovich tribe and uh, savor the community from Venetians. The plot of the tale, uh, Kanjos Macedonovic was set in the 15th century, but political sacraments uh, actually refer to the 8070, in fact, the Ottoman wars. From the uh, viewpoint of small hero fighting uh, for life and uh, despising uh, death. The story is relatively uh, simple. Uh, the Pashtrovich trader Kanjos Macedonovic uh, lives for Venice uh, with a boat full of oil, uh, wine, uh, tala and uh, socks uh, to trade with the Venetians, hoping that they would not make uh, any uh, trouble uh, for him and then they will would uh, respect the agreement and peace uh, they had made. Kanyosh is an uh, illustration of the medieval uh, trader and his trade in produce from Montenegrin coast. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Venetian uh, want to charge uh, duties on his uh, goods. Kanyosh is trying uh, to resolve things uh, with Venetian administration. Uh, the Venetian uh, despise him. Uh, Kanyosh would wait for a few hours uh, for the reception uh, only to be uh, come one or two days later, told him. Uh, deeply disappointed with the Venetian uh, behavior, uh, he decided uh, to withdraw uh, and uh, stop trading. At the same time, uh, another fatal and uh, disturbing situation was happening in Venice. Uh, shaking the entire republic, uh, a fearless warrior named Furlan uh, came from the province of uh, Freely, uh, challenging the Dutch of Venice uh, to a duel or uh, surrender. The Dutch was uh, 
an older man and was unable uh, to find a brave deputy. Canius made fun of the uh, false heroism uh, of the Venetian people, uh, emphasizing uh, the Venetian administration that there were hundreds of brave young men in his country who could easily defeat the giant. Uh, for such a statement, Kanyosh was uh, called uh, upper uh, before the Dutch. The Dutch asked uh, Kanyosh uh, to bring a brave warrior from his country. Uh, he got uh, tamping, promise, and free trade uh, offers from Dutch. That motivate him to return uh, to his uh, tribe and uh, find uh, someone uh, to uh, comfort Furlan uh, in search of the Dutch. Uh, the assembly uh, decide uh, to send Kanyosh uh, to the duel with uh, Furlan. Uh, Kanyosh uh, short uh, structure uh, and physical weakness did not uh, inspire uh, confidence in uh, no one among the nation uh, believed Kanyosh would be able to defeat a fiercest giant uh, Furlan. Uh, Lubisha uh, portrays Venetian as liars, uh, hypocrite, arrogant, uh, plain coward, uh, who let another man uh, fight for their interest. Kanyos left for the island in the boat. Uh, when, he find, when he found out uh, the Kanyos was uh, adversary and come to the island, the Dutch representative uh, Furlan uh, thought he was joking. Uh, Kanyosh uh, surprised Furlan by uh, pushing his boat uh, at it uh, because only one would be uh, needed. He turned an unfortunate situation uh, to his advantage and expressed his self comfortable uh, in this way. Kanyosh won the duel because he turned uh, Furlan uh, so uh, that the sun uh, glared into his eyes. Uh, he took uh, advantage to loaves of uh, nature and uh, used uh, his widow uh, to defeat the enemy. By uh, defeating a much uh, stronger enemy, Kanyosh provide that a smart man of a strong spirit with idols uh, and uh, fight in himself can uh, compense uh, all the physical shortcoming with his skill and uh, wisdom. Uh, the winner of the duel, uh, Kanyos, won for his prize nothing more uh, than chapter allowing him uh, and the Pashtrovici to trade freely. He brought Furlan's ring and uh, swerved uh, as a gift to the Dutch. And the Venetian uh, dignitaries organized a ceremony at St. Mark Church uh, in his honor. After that success, the Dodge uh, rewarded uh, him with chest full of gold, which he refused with an explanation uh, that they should put more uh, in the chest than take out. And then he put his one uh, ducket uh, into it. He does provide that he don't care uh, for the treasure and 
that he wanted was honoring agreement and promises. Then the Dutch offer his daughter's hand in marriage. But like Martin Kirpan, uh, Kanyos refused the princess uh, hand in marriage. Namely, the story end uh, with Kanyos only uh, wish. Uh, fulfilled uh, gaining uh, free trade privileges. As a reward, he will accept that the Venetian do not charge duties uh, to Pastrovici uh, and that a coast is named Slavic. Kanyos express the sacrifice of the Pastrovici in relation to the Venetians, which was still uh, vivid in the collective memory. In the epilogue of this tale, it was noted that the Venetians failed to respect the agreements and that they were again making a trade difficult, as before. In the end, the narrator uh, emphasized uh, that Venetian ended up uh, as they deserve, which is allusion to downfall of Venetian Empire. Uh, Kanyos uh, was important uh, aspect of uh, self-determination uh, of Montenegrins and uh, influenced uh, the creation of heroic spirit. Uh, in the political uh, struggle of Montenegrins for uh, independence, uh, 1876 uh, to 1878 and uh, 2006, this tale uh, suggests that the fight is uh, oneself and one uh, ideal can help to win a uh, warrior's battle uh, for it to preserve one uh, ethnic origin. The element of uh, hero struggle and honor is essential uh, just as Kanyos fight for his people and the benefit of all, so uh, should the nation fight for its freedom and self-determination. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, dear, dear Professor, professor uh, could you uh, just... Could you just, just uh, we are we having, are having an echo. an echo. Господь Петър, за кама му ми е, Господ Марян е имел втлопен микрофон. Зая съм го изтлопил, по потем колко господ отговаря втлопен на зая микрофон. Добре. професор Премович, thank you for your paper. Um, I can definitely see several connections and you actually emphasize them uh, to the previous paper on Мартин Крпан. So I think it would be perhaps best to leave the first question uh, to Professor Darowitz. Darko, if you agree. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ziga. Thank you, Marian, for this uh, great presentation, uh, for the connections with uh, the story of the Martin Karpan, as it was uh, expressed just by Ziga Oman. Uh, I don't know, I, when we were talking, uh, if you remember, Marian, about these heroes and about these mythologies, we have emphasized that uh, the many stories in our regions are compared with uh, outlaw heroes and with the nation building. Uh? Uh, so, uh, this uh, point of view it is um, very interesting for me and I would like also to ask uh, our dearest uh, Professor Pal 
coal store, uh, which has uh, great connections uh, with other uh, researchers from the Southeastern Europe's countries with previous uh, publications. If we we have some opportunities to study this this moments, so the the moments of the outlaw heroes uh, in the uh, nation building uh, processes. So I would like just our our free to connect <laughs> with an, another question. Uh, Professor Costa, I think this question was directed to you, if you're still with us. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm not sure if I could. Uh, did you want us to start a collaborative uh, project on uh, uh, outlaws in, in nation buildings? <laughs> uh, was that it? Uh, I mean, uh, I have, um, it's, I guess, 10, 15 perhaps years since I did any research on the Balkans. So I have moved on to other projects, so I, 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 I'm afraid I will not be available for, for that. Was it, but maybe I misunderstood your question, or? No, uh, I, I, I would like just to ask you your your opinion uh, about the, the studies, uh, about the outlaw heroes in the uh, nation building uh, processes. Right. <laughs> I I would be very glad. I would be very very glad if you can join also in, in this idea. But I, I understand that you're right. involved in other projects. But just your opinion. Uh, how do you see this this question in all the aspects uh, that you have studies studied uh, about the nation building? in state building processes. Right. Well, I, I, I guess I, I have listened to, to your the two uh, presentations more for learning. I, I'm not sure if I have uh, very much to, to, to contribute with, but um, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, I realized that uh, what are regarded as heroes uh, among the, the common people will often be the same as as uh, are regarded as villains uh, among the people in power, uh, and uh, so and you can see that in 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 also in contemporary um, settings. But I'm afraid uh, uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have, have much to, to contribute with here, I'm afraid. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, if there are any other questions for any of the panelists on this uh, first panel, I will, I will please ask you, I mean, I'm asking you to ask your questions. Mm. All right, if there are no more questions. Uh, my sincere thanks in the name of the entire organizing committee and all project partners to all three lecturers for their insightful and interesting papers. Now, of course, we can make a five minute break, but now my colleague, Professor Darovitz, uh, we'll take over the next panel, uh, one of the three with the title Between History and Cultural Memory. Um, you're welcome to stay with us. Thank you. Giga, thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, our colleague Andrei Rachten is with us. I propose... Of course, I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Hello. I propose that we continue with our uh, papers, with the presentation of the papers. Uh, I would like just briefly to present uh, my dearest colleague, 
Andrei Rachten. Uh, he is the researcher of the science and uh, research center of the Slovenian Academy of the Sciences and Arts. Uh, he is also the uh, full professor at the University of, of Maribor. Uh, in the last years, uh, or I can say that his entire research work is oriented in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, the connections between Slovenia and uh, other countries, uh, the, the, the problem of uh, national uh, questions. Uh, so I uh, leave the word to him to, to present his research paper about the as he entitled uh, Slovene National Emancipatory Aspirations after the dissolution of the Habsburg Monarchy. Please, Andrei, you can Thank start. you, Darko, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude that uh, I was invited to this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, it's, it, it is indeed, indeed an honor to be present here today and present some of my research results, um, including the project which was led uh, by Dr. Darovitz. And uh, I'm especially grateful for him that he invited me to this project. And I will try to, to make a short summary of my part of research in the project. So uh, I will try first uh, to organize uh, is a short uh, PowerPoint, and then we shall proceed. So uh, I think it looks nice. Yes, just just a few seconds, and then we will have the PowerPoint. We see it. Yes, it is. It is there. So uh, I think uh, we made it for the first part of my presentation. Um, I will I will speak in my mother tongue since uh, the organizers provided summaries uh, of our of our papers. So uh, I will I will go on in my uh, mother tongue. Spoštovani gospod prodekan, dragi Darko, drage prijateljice in prijatelji, kot sem že dejal v angliškem uvodu, moja želja je, da predstavim v tem referatu zelo nakratko tiste glavne značilnosti povezane z, z torej, slovensko narodno emancipacijsko voljo v postimperialni tranzicijski dobi. Zdaj, seveda, v tem uh, času lahko naredimo en, bi rekel, res uh, hiter uh, pregled, um, vendar seveda z nekaterimi poantami, ki se meni zdijo še posebej uh, pomembne in zanimive. Um, naj ob tej razglednici, ki jo nekateri izmed vas, ki ste mogoče kakšno mojo knjigo že prebrali, tudi dobro poznate, ker sem uporabil za naslovnico svoje zadnje knjige po razpadu skupne države, um, Uporabim kot neke vrste simbol. A ne? Danes je bilo veliko govora o mitih, veliko bilo govora o simboliki. In jaz mislim, da je ta razglednica, ki je bila poslana že po razpadu Hasburgske monarkije znamenitemu slovenskemu odvetniku in politiko Josipu Vilfanu, več kot dober, bi rekel, primer, kako so pravzaprav pesipirali stanje po razpadu Hasburgske imperija, tisti, ki so bili njegovi nasprotniki. Ne. Kajti ta razglednica, ki je bila poslana Josipu Vilfanu, um, je seveda bila poslana strani nekoga, ki je v eni predvsej polononi nemščini Vilfana, ki je takrat še bil poslanec v rimskem parlamentu, um, pošiljal nazaj v, v Avstrijo, uh, 
на заека Франца Йожефо, а не и на Хасбургски монархии, из которой со все словенцы осамосвоили конец октобра 1918. Зато е туди мое предавание правоправо наменено тему, тему в добью, тей би реко тему в квиру, и ки е некако замејено, че погледамо от конца октобра 1918, озирамо за едно предзгодбо Майничке декларации, же лета 17, па все до лета 1921 до автономистичне изјаве словенских разумников и, сега, крати с тем туди видоданско устава. Здай, тук в мест бостите видел, е, сега, некай уместних постаи, 200 згодописи, че предсей добро стандартно обделани, торей, Словенci v državi, Slovenci v Hrvatu in Srbov. In seveda tisto, kar si poznamo, ko obrnemo kratico SKS, dobimo preljevino Srbov, Hrvatu in Slovencev. Potem pa bom nakratko spregovaril o dveh možnih alternativah, možnih narekovajo, kajti seveda v gotovil bomo, da seveda ni bilo političnega konsenza, kaj šele, da bi lahko računali, da bi se slovenska politika v tej smeri resno pogovarjala. Imamo pa nekaj zanimivih primerov, dveh možnih alternativ, ki se nekako ponujejo ravno sedaj, ko letos obeležujemo 30 let slovenske države. Namreč, ali so takrat slovenci po razpadu Hasburgske monarkije in vstopu v novo državo imeli priložnost razmišljati tudi mogoče v državni samostojnosti. Tukaj zdaj ne mislim govoriti o tisočletnih sanjah, nočem prezeti vloge nacionalističnega aktivista, kot ker bi morda kdo si razmišljal, ampak želim čisto, bi rekel, racionalno spregovoriti o tej opciji, za katero bomo videli, da je obstajala v enem zanimivem primeru enega primorskega begunca, ampak o tem več po točku štiri. Druga alternativa, ki se je nekako ponujala in je morda celo bila zastopa na strani večjih razumnikov in politikov tistega časa, pa je bilo razmišljanje o podobnostki federaciji, tudi konfederaciji, seveda pojmovanja so različna, tudi veliko je terminoloških zmet v tistem času, ampak recimo, da imenujemo to pod nekim skupnim nastavom podobnostka federacije. Zdaj, seveda, po vstopu v novo državo je bilo na eni strani ogromno hvalnica, kako je sedaj končno slovenski narod dosegel to, kar si je prizadeval tako kot tisočletja, sedaj končno v svoji državi. Hasburgska monarchija je označena kot tuja država, Hasburgska dinastija kot tuja dinastija in tako napredeno naštevam, kaj se je takrat pripomogel k temu, da se je demoniziralo še nedavno pred tega. Tisto, kar pa je bila sveta točka in katero lahko priznavajo tudi kritiki takratnega stanja, ki ni bilo rožno, to o to bomo to danes pregovorili, za slovenski narodni razvoj, pa je bila ustanovita Slovenska univerza. Torej, univerza v Ljubljani je 23. juli z sankcijo regenta Aleksandra postala resničnost in tako je po več desetletjih, tamo leta 1848, sej, vendar le dozorel ta veliki načrt, da so ga lahko slovenci izpolnili. Zdaj je bil ta načrt poln slučajnosti, improvizacije in tudi nagajanja, je druga zgodba, ki smo tudi nekako v tem našem, kaj narečem, v naši želi, da te velike obletnice vendar le prazdujemo brez senčnih podarkov, malo pozabil, in bo mogoče danes, kolikor bo čas dopušal še kakšnega omena. In čisto na koncu, ker se mi zdi, da se nekako vrnemo na izhodišče, na izhodišče Majniške deklaracije, prav z avtonomistično izjavo, ki je prvi tak državnopravni dokument po Majniške deklaraciji, kjer pravzaprav en krok 43 slovenskih razumnikov nekako na novo začne razmišljati o tem, pravzaprav kaj se je zgodilo tistega vsodnega 1. decembra 1918 ko je prišlo v Belgrado do združitve Južne Slovanov, Hasburgske monarkije in pa kraljevine Srbije. Zdaj, seveda, začel bom z enim citatom, ki nas bo najbolj upeljal v mentaliteto, v miselnost tistega časa. Torej, citatom, ki lepo kaže, 
kako je takratna intelektualna elita in Franz Leški Finšgar zamiti duhovnik, a ne je gotovo sodil sam vrh te intelektualne elite, namreč bilo zelo blizu vedno vladajočim strukturam, znal se je prilagajati različnim časovnim okvirom, ne nazadnje tudi političnim okvirom in nekako preživel vse te velike režimske spremembe vedno v bližini oblasti in seveda si je lahko potem privošil tudi to vrstne udarne misli, kot jih najdemo v Slovencu 28. januarja 1922. Ko pravi, danes imamo svojo državo, prišla je tri prvi vejak dreveso, kaj mu spada. Ne pozamem, da smo bili za svetovno diplomacijo, mi še tadaj rojeni, ko se je zapisalo prvič SKS, znamenita kratica, akronim. Registr zunajnega ministrstva na Dunaju svedočijo, da se je imel Slovenije ceniti enkrat imenovalo v diplomatičnem svetu, nas za ta svet ni bilo. No, vidimo, zelo, bi rekel, ostra izjava, zelo, bi rekel, jasna izjava, seveda moramo se postaviti v kontekst tistega časa, To je čas predvsej kudih centralizacijskih posegov iz Belgrada, to je tudi čas, ko začnejo vendar le nekateri razmišljati tudi izven okviru nekega unitarističnega jugoslavanskega entuzijazma in zato je Finšgar, ki je že zelo zgodaj, že v času, bi rekel, dekzeracijskega gibanja, podprl povezovanje slovencev z kraljevino Srbijo, moral očitno nastopiti, mora za svoje autoriteto pisatelja, intelektualca, če hočete duhovnika in jasno postaviti stvari na svoje mesto, vse tako, kot jih je vsega on mislil in si jih zamislil. Zdaj, tukaj ne bi šli v preteklost, ne bomo šli zdaj gledati, ali so slovenci res v diplomaciji bili posebne znani. Tukaj je seveda predvsej pritiravanja in seveda je treba reči, da je ta Finšgorjeva misel tudi bila za tiste čase z zelo jasnim namenom, da preseka kakršno kol alternativno razmišljanje glede na tisto jugoslavansko realnost. Zdaj, seveda, slovenci vstopijo, in v tem imamo na tisočeh knjig, v Hasburško monarhijo, na krilih enega gibanja, ki ga imenujemo deklaracijsko gibanje, ki temeli na deklaraciji, ki jo 30. maja prebere takrat že ključni slovenski državnik v Hasburški monarkiji Anton Korošec v Dunajskem parlamentu. Tu imamo enega od konceptov, ki ga hrani Narodna izvetna knjižnica v Ljubljani, kjer vidimo, da je Korošec osebno, to je namreč na govoru popis, posegal v samo, bi rekel, osnutek te dikcije in tu vidite, se je prav odločil, da bo dodal, da je treba v to izjavo, da se morajo slovenci in Hrvati in si južni slovani v Hasburški monarkiji med sabo povezati na posebno državno pravno enoto, da je on tukaj dodal v grunt des nacionalnim princips, torej na osnovi narodnega načela, on del kroatični štac rekte, storej in hrvaškega državnega prava. Zdaj se da to nas ne sme, ne eno na drugo nas ne sme preseniti. Mogoče nas danes, več kot sto let kasneje, preseniti omemba hrvaškega državnega prava, ampak moramo se zavedati, da ne slovenska politika vse do prve svetovne obojne, še zlasti ta mainstream, glavna linija vse slovenske ljudske stranke, ki jo tudi vodi Anton Korošec, gradi svojo južnoslavansko smeritev na hrvaškem državnem pravu. Ne bom rekel, da vsi govorijo, da so slovenci pa nizki hrvati, kot kar je večkrat razlagal Janez in Angelis Grek, ampak dejstvo je, da imamo tukaj eno zelo močno večinsko mnenje v mainstreamu slovenske politike, tudi pri interih liberalci, kot je recimo Ivan Tavčar, da je potrebno graditi to novo državno državno pravno enoto južnih slovanov na temelju hrvaškega državnega prava. Tisto, kar je novo in kar mogoče iz tistega konteksta, če se poživimo v tisti čas preseneti, je prav to v grunt des nacionalnim princip. Torej, načelo narodnega povezovanja, narodne samoodločbe, ki, za katero vemo, da jo lansira v svet ameriški predsednik Thomas Wilson, 
Um, pri čemer sveda ne, tisto, kar je Wilson prenoval pod narodno samodločbo je nekaj drugega, kot kar si zamišljajo prekrati slovenski politiki, kar spoznajo seveda predvsej boleče šele na Pariški mnovni konferenci, ko je pravzaprav že lahko rečemo prepozna, nekako kar bi rekel dr. Bister Eswa Cušpet, majestet. Um, in zdaj seveda tisto, kar potem na tej manjiški deklaraciji ne, gradijo slovenci, je seveda neka državno-pravna enota, Zdaj, v tistem procesu razpadanja Hasburgske monarhije tam v, v sredi jeseni leta 1917 je predvsej seveda dilem, predvsej ne znank. Um, lahko rečemo, ne, da, da se slovenska politika takrat predvsej lovi. Ne, um, tukaj imamo seveda jasno eno od razlag, ki jo poda na znameniti nekdani zgodovinarski, bi rekel, Vzor, ne, Ljudmil Hauptmann, 1920, um, ni se ukvarjal samo z medijevistiko, a ne, kot se nam časih zdi, ker je bil res uh, velika avtoriteta, ampak seveda tisto, kar je treba povedati, um, glasno se je takrat, leta 1920, ravno zaradi teh dilem, ki so se pojavljale uh, in želel nekoliko krepiti slovensko samozavest uh, v tistih relativno težkih časih diplomatskih neuspehov in centralističnega pritiska z Beograda, ko pravi, ne, slovenci so brez trdih državnih tradicij, za to brez privojenega političnega čuta. Ne, to je nekaj vrsto samo upravičilo za, lahko rečemo, vse tiste uh, napake, zdrse, spodresljaje, za katere seveda so slovenci bili časih sami krivi, časih tudi ne, objektivne mednarodne količine, vse kako niso bile naklonjene takratni slovenski narodno emancipacijski volji. In um, tisto, kar potem nastane, torej država Slovencev, Hrvatov in Srbov z narodno vlado Slovencev, Hrvatov in Srbo v Ljubljani, a ne, um, lahko ne, interpretiramo a ne, tudi kot izraz slovenske uh, samostojne državnosti, pravim lahko, a ne, kajti prvič je ta zgodba zamejena z enim zelo kratkim časovnim obdobjem dobrega meseca in drugič, ta tvorba ne doživi mednarodnega priznanja. A ne, in to se mi zdi, ko gre za spoštovanje narodno emancipacijske volje a, slovenskega naroda takrat, a ne, a, mogoče še tist naj, najbolj boleč, bolečja okoliščina. Anton Poroše sicer takrat potuje po Evropi, a, je v Švici na pogajanih z a, srbskim legendarnim politikom a, Nikolo Pašičem, gre potem tudi v Pariz, ampak tisti sporozum, ki ga s Kenes Pašičem in z šefom Ligoslavonskega odbora Anten Trupičem, je pravzaprav um, mrtva črka na papirju. Dobesedno, kaj ti Pašič potem sprovocira po podpisu tega sporozuma, ki naj bi omogočil neke vrste dualistično uh, južnoslavansko državo. A ne? Pašič enostavno sprovocira uh, odstop uh, srpske vlade, ki je takrat še vedno na krfu, Uh, in ko Korošec potem pride v Pariz, se pogovarjati z francoskim zunanjim ministrom uh, Stevenom Pišonom, uh, in mu začne razlagati, kako fajn sporozum je skleno v Ženevi z Pašičem, mu reče Pišon, ja, že vem, že vem, to itak vse propad, sem bil veščen v strani srbske ambasade, da z tega ne bo nič. Ne? Torej, vidite, ne, to, je ta, to je prvo veliko razočaranje samega Korošca, ki se potem nekako umakne iz tega diplomatskega dogajanja in se potem celoti posveti beograjski stvarnosti. Ko rečemo o beograjski stvarnosti, je seveda jasno, a, prvo decembrski akt 1917 a, je tisti prelomni dogodek, tista cezura, ne, ker od katerega, od katere naprej ni več povratka. Čeprav se eni misla, ne, da bo možno potem v pogajanih za novo ustavo marsikej še spremeniti, dopolniti, preoblikovati, se potem izkaže, da tisto, kar je, uh, torej, sama, uh, torej, adresa Narodnega večja SHS, ki jo je prebral en gospod Ante Pavelič, ki ga ne smemo zamenjati z enim poglavnikom Ante Paveličem, ampak ga moramo imeti za zobozdravnika. Torej, Ante Pavelič takrat seveda gre mimo na vodil, ki jih dobi uh, v Zagrebu v okviru Narodnega večja SHS, ki je bilo legalni legalni seda zastopnik, seda bevčej južnih slovanov, um, morda tudi legitimni, ampak seda brez mednarodnega priznanja in seda brez teh napotkov, brez tega kakršnega kol, uh, bi rekel, upoštevanja um, tistih ključnih stvari, kot je dvotretinska večina za sprejem ustave, kot je ohranitev uh, pokrajinskih uh, deželnih zborov, um, ni enostavno možno govoriti o nekem enakopravnem odnosu, če prav 
lahko rečemo, da je v sami v tem odgovoru regenta Aleksandra najti nekaj zanimivih elementov, ki pričajo, da je vendar le na nek način saj implicitno priznaval neke vrste neodvisnosti države SHS. Ampak to so že, bi rekel, debate na ravni državnega prava, ki zahtevajo seveda nek posebni okvir. Če gremo zdaj k alternativam, prva alternativa samostojna je Slovenija. Zdaj je veste, da smo bili priča v zadnjih letih, ker nekaj to vrstim dogodkom, razstavam, knjigam in tako naprej, nekako večkrat najdemo te tisošetne sanje, večkrat najdemo to, da že od nekdaj slovenci želijo živeti sami, da je zredina Slovenija praktično že bila zahteva za samostojno državo, vsi, ki pač se malo bojo resno ukvarjamo z torej zgodovinskimi procesi, vemo, da seveda je to presečne pretiravanje, nimamo niti enega samega mainstream politika tistega časa, ki bi iskal kakršno koli samo slovensko državno pobudo. Imamo pa eno pismo, ki je zanimivo, čeprav smo ga že nekako pred dvema letoma premjerno predstavljali na enem drugem predavanju, pa potem tudi objavljali knjigi o razpadu skupne države, je šlo kar nekako mimo vseh tih debata, ko se lepo skuša za nazaj risati samo slovenske državne koncepte, namreč to je edini, pravzaprav, če hočete, ne, saj jaz druge ne poznam, to je edini papir, edino pismo, edini dokument, resno oblikovan, ki govori o tem, da kaj bi bilo, če bi slovenci imeli svojo lasno državo že takrat. V kontekstu ravno tega, kar nas danes najbolj zanima, in to je ta narodna emancipacijska volja v mednarodnem okviru. In torej, pismo je podpisal, tudi se celo vidi, mislim, da se vidi, Josip Vidmar, begunec, pregnanec, kot kaj piše iz kanala v Soči, ki se zateče potem na to stran meje, v Jugoslavijo, in potem napiše tole pismo, tako rekoč v začetku Pariške mravne konference, naslovljeno je na posebno Ljubljansko komisijo, ki pripravlja gradivo za Pariško mravno konferenco in jo takrat vodi že Fran Vodopivec in seveda v njem, kaj pravi, kaj pravi Vidmar, ne? Bojš bi bilo, če bi slovenci nastopali sami, potem bi tudi italijanska država ne imela tako velikih ambicij, tako pa se boji slovencov, ker bo dodel ene velike Jugoslavije, mogoče bi se dalo na skotnem premjeru pogovarjati celo v nekih koncesijah, tudi ko gre za obalo, ko gre za pristanišča, trst in tako naprej, ne? Vsi vemo, da je bilo takšno razmišljanje takrat zelo naivno, ampak seveda očitno imamo nekoga, ki razmišlja v tej smeri, ki ima neko, lahko rečemo, težko izkušnjo kot begunec, ampak kaj se zgodi s tem pismom? To pismo seveda potem pride do Frana Vodopilca, ki pa še mu na kraj pameti ne spade, da bi to pismo pošiljal kamorkoli, ali mogoče tim se znano celo recimo enega Antona Korosa, ne? Torej, jugoslovenska opcija je tako prirodajoča v slovenski prišnji eliti, da na to pismo potem napiše znameniti odslovilni pridevek ad acta. Torej, šel je v predal in potem se je pojavil en registrovalec pred dvema letama in pol, ki ga je v enem zaprašenem fajlu v arhivu Republike Slovenije odkril. Druga opcija – Podolanska konfederacija. O tem ne bi zgubilo veliko besed, kaj ti smo že kar predvsej v tem tudi lahko brali. Vemo, da je leta 18 Iva Šustrašič predlagal eno tako podolansko konfederacijo, ki bi imela naziv za edinjene podolanske države. Vemo, da je Hedvig Tuma znameniti primorski socialdemokrat, tudi razmišljal o neki ohranitve nekega podolanskega postora, seveda ne z vrhnac Borčko monarkijo, ampak v okviru neke konfederacije republika, ne. Manj znamo pa je mogoče, da je leta 1919 Josip Puntar, eden od glavnih publicistov iz kroga katoriških narodnjakov, tudi nekako ugotovil, da to, bi rekel, razcepljanje srednje Evrope so vražnosti zaradi novih meja po razpadu nekdajne skupne države, nekamor ne vodi in tudi pravi, morali bomo nekaj razmisliti o neki novi demokratično prevrjeni zgradbi, kaj ti, citiram, vedno se ne bomo mogli med seboj naklati in zapirati si drug drugem v mej, ker so življenjski stiki prenujni. Torej, vidite, eno zelo racionalno razmišljanje, lahko rečemo, ne, moderno razmišljanje, vendar predvsej osamljeno 
kaj ti vodi ne takratni slovenski politik Anton Korošec, je takrat v sicer en drugem kontekstu posem jasno zavrno, kakršno pol podonovsko konfederativno opcijo z številnimi, bi rekel, razlogi. En od njih je bil tudi ta, da Jugoslavija ne potrebuje kakršno pol konfederacije, ker ima itak svoje veliko jadransko obalo in je samo zadost. In ko smo že pri samo zadostnosti, še en povdarek, kakor sem dajal predzadnji povdarek tega današnjega kratkega referata, kjer povzemam rezultate raziskov v okviru projekta Gradniki. Namreč Slovensko univerzo. Ko je bila ta veliko obletnica, pred dvema letoma smo v tem veliko prebrali. Čeprav smo ugotovili, da kljub s tem številnim razpravom še vedno ostaja dilema, kateri je tisti ključni datum, ko je ministerski svet pod predsedstvom Antona Korosca sprijemal odločitev o ustanovitvi univerze. Imamo tukaj, bi rekel, dve verzi, 30. juni ali 2. juli. Dobro, vemo, kdaj je bila sankcija regenta, 23. juli. Vemo tudi, da je pravzaprav ta ustanovitev vsad enega dogoletnega razvoja, ki je slegal tale čevčase Frasburgske monarkije. Že v času Frasburgske monarkije imamo številne pobude slovenskih poslancov, pa ne samo slovenskih, naj povdarjamo, da v tej isti zbornici, v kateri je danes sedež Ljubljanske univerze in je res ena najljepša zgrad, lahko rečemo, v Ljubljani, v tej isti zbornici je tik pred tem, da da je bila zadeva sprožena kot neka interpelacija slovenskih poslancev, podprla to idejo tudi stranka, ki jo rečemo po domače nemška stranka, uradno bila to stranka krajinskih ustavljenih ali posesnikov, ki jo je takrat vodil Jozef Baron Švegl, znameniti diplomat iz Bleda, ki je ugotavljal, da si Ljubljana zasluži svojo univerzo in da mora ta univerzo seveda dobiti neko mednarodno razsežnost in on je že takrat predlagal, da bi ta univerza morala biti večjezična. Torej, več kot 120 let kasneje ugotavljamo, kako moderne, pravzaprav so takrat nekatere zamisli. Ampak seveda potem je se je skazalo, da edino Ljubljana od vseh teh pomembnih mest ni dobila izpolnene te želje, če lahko rečemo, da so slovenci dozorili v največji možni meri kot kulturna nacija, torej vse do tega, da lahko govorimo tudi že o slovenci kot politični naci, saj imajo tudi svoje parlamentarne zastopnike, izrazito celo vplivne v dunajskih vladnih krogih svoj čas, pa lahko rečemo, da ta univerza nekje ustala, ne izpolnen sen, ki se je v resničju po leti 1919. Zdaj, manj zdano je, da je pravzaprav resnično prišlo takrat tik pred ustanovitev univerze, dokaj nekaj, bi rekel, kontraakcij unitarističnih sil v državi, ki so nekako uporekale slovencem pravico, da imajo svojo univerzo, ampak ne toliko značenih razlogov, ampak iz tako njih praktičnih razlogov. Če še zakaj bi morala graditi novo univerzo, če pa je žitak ena v Belgrado, če je tako že ena v Zagrebo. In manj znano je, da so takrat potem, torej meseca junija, sprožili slovenski politiki eno zelo močno akcijo, po nekem, lahko rečemo, naključju. Zakaj? Zato, ker je takrat bila v debati reforma Belgrajske univerze in je takratni prosvetni minister Ljuba Davidovič predložil zakon glede reforme Belgrajske univerze. In takrat so slovenski politiki želeli, da se zadeva reši relativno hitro in da se vključi v ta zakon o reformi Belgrajske še ustanovitev Ljubljanske. To je povrčil veliko odpor, ampak na srečo oslovencev je takrat bil odnos med Antonom Korosem in torej demokrati, takratnimi srpskimi demokrati, tako dober, da je potem Davidovič sam pripravil nov zakonski predlog in ga potem tudi speljal skozi proceduro. Tako da je potem vendar le ta univerzija, Ampak to je tisto, kar se nekaj. To je bila najbolj vesela novica, lahko rečemo, ustanovne dobe vsej iz slovenske, te bi rekel, narodne perspektive. Vse ostalo so bile slabe novice, ampak seveda tisto, kar nas nekako potem tudi formalno zbudi iz tistega stanja depresije, ko pravzaprav 
slovenstvo razmišlja kako naprej, a ne, je avtonomistična izjava, a ne, ki je nekako v senci ostalih dogajanj, ki jo nekako vendar le, a ne, ne štajemo kot tist ključni dokument, še zlasti, ker zbledi ob velikem prelomnem pomenu majniške deklaracije. Jakob Mohorič je eden glavnih prvakov na prehodu iz Hasburgske monarhije v Jugoslavijo, je nekje zapisal v svojih spominih, da je bila majniška deklaracija pravzaprav edini politični kapital, ki so imeli slovenci obstopo v jugoslovansko državo, kajti z njim so lahko dokazovali svojo res veliko jugoslovansko usmerjenost. Zdaj, avtonomistična izjava pravzaprav stvari bere na začetek. 43 razumnikov se tam, bi rekel, konec zime 1921 organizira okoli kroga Albina Prepeluka, nekdajnega socialdemokrata, ki potem vedno bolj postaja agrari narodnjak, če ga tako imenujemo, kjer pravzaprav zelo jasno nastopijo proti enem procesu, ki se nekako vedno bolj na glas, prva po tiho, potem pa na glas, krepi in to je nekega unitarističnega jugoslavanstva ali kot kar se zrazo en dekadnih publicistov forsiranja jugoslovenščine, In tukaj na te točki se slovenski razumniki več ne organizirajo levo, desno, liberalno, konzervativno, ampak je to prelomni dogodek za to, ker se začnejo slovenski razumniki, intelektualna elita deliti potem ali so za avtonomistični slovenski razvoj v novi državi ali pristajajo na trd jugoslovanski unitaristični koncept. In to je tisto, kar vrne vse slovence na začetek, kar jih vrne na izhodišče majniške deklaracije, sicer že v novi državi, in kar jih potem nekako dokončno vrže iz te, bi rekel, tega pojenjajočega entuzijazma, je videl danska ostava. Torej, 28. juni, 1921, kot kar se zraza Nikola Pašič, dan, ki je vrno Srbo carstvo, je seveda za slovensko avtonomistično misel velik udarec. In seveda tisti, ki berejo z vrsticami, tisti, ki so znali avtonomistično izjavo brat v svojem bistvu, kajti morala je seveda vsebovati tudi nekaj lojalističnih oddanostnih formul, so razumeli, da so slovenci pravzaprav na začetku, ampak tisto, kar je ključno, je to, in kar velja vse do razpada potem jugoslovanske države, tudi takšen položaj slovencev, tudi takšna omajevanje njihovih avtonomističnih težen, narodno emancipacijskih težen, je pravzaprav še vedno boljši položaj, kot so ga imeli njihovi sonarodnjaki v zamejstvu. Hvala lepa. Andrej, najlepša hvala za to je poglobljeno razmišljanje, predstavitev. Te prosim edino, da izklopiš šerenje PowerPointa, zato da bodo naslednji lahko to počeli. Andrej, vse tle. Samo tam share, pritisneš x. Moram priznati, da ne vem, katero ne pritisneš. Zgoraj pri liv, tle, ki imaš mikrofon, share content, pritisneš. In daš x. X mora biti okvirčko. Sam pritisni. Torej, če se gre v naš pogovor, tu, kje smo pač imamo sestanek, potem tam poleg mikrofona desno mora biti okvirček in znotraj njega x. Ja. Ampak to, če sem pritisnil x, in neč ne pomaga. Je to puščico, moraš pritisniti. A kako je? Izberete sestanek, pa pritisnite Escape. Po mojem mnenju, če 
se daj se odblogira in potem se spet priklopi, bo lahko šlo. To tudi je možnost. No, potem se bo podklopil na svijene. Potem se priklopiš. Ne, ne. Takoj. Dobro, priklopi se nazaj. Ok. I would like to thank to our colleague Andrej Rahten for his presentation and now I would like to invite my dearest colleague, friend, Angel Casal, which is a professor of early modern history at the University of Barcelona. He is specialized in the history of banditry, military history and various forms of social violence. He has authored several books and uh, numerous papers uh, and he will present us uh, a very interesting topic for nowadays, I think so. The conflict as a construction tool of national identity. Catalonia 15-16-17-14. Dear Angel, the word is the word is your. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, first, the PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's it's okay. The Yes, yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for giving me the opportunity to join this meeting about one of the more important topics in the past, the present, and probably the future of Europe, the building processes of nations and state nations. I would like to warn you of the limited fluidity of my spoken English and thank you in advance for your patience regarding the linguistic aspect of my conference. The topic I am addressing is different from the other ones being presented. The case of Catalonia is that of a group of people that follow the historical processes for the creation of a differentiated national identity without becoming a state nation. This study focuses on the counter identity or counter image, understood as one of the many elements used in constructing the affirmation of a community. In this case, using as an inverted mirror the characteristics attributed to the neighboring communities with which relations during the early modern period were usual, usually difficult. difficult. Although this aspect could have negative connotations associated with xenophobia, we must not forget that. As well as stereotypes, it's a build on shared history from wars to cultural exchange and that in the imagination of a national group it can be studied as a separate element within the set that forms identity. The thesis of my work is that between the Middle Ages and the modern age, the visions of Castile and Catalonia are evolving in relation to the concept of Spain, which are first different and then enter into, into competition. In Catalonia, during the modern age, a negative vision of France born of political and military conflict was consolidated. Castile and French are the counter image that will serve to make a model of national vindication from the 19th century. In this speech, I will focus on the following aspects. The creation of a historical discourse on a medieval origins, the idea of Spain in Castile and Catalonia, the language conflict, the political confrontation with the Spanish Habsburg Empire, 
and finally the romantic version of Catalan history. The end of the Roman Empire left its Hispanic provinces under the domination of a Visigothic monarchy, which uh, was a military elite rallying a Christianized, Latinized population and integrating with, with it very slowly. So slowly, in fact, that we can now say that the process was complete in 711 when the Muslims came into the peninsula. The end of the Visigothic kingdom left some unoccupied centers in the Cantabrian, Cantabrian north of the peninsula and in the Pyrenees, where the first Christian political organizations operate. From this, the four great Christian states emerged, Castile, Aragon, Navarra, and the county of Barcelona. The kings of Castile created a legitimacy that made them descendants of the Asturian kings, who, in turn, had proclaimed themselves descendants of the Visigothic royal house. The idea essentially exalted the Visigothic past of all Hispania, ignoring almost all, all, all history before the arrival of the Visigoths, who were presented as the predecessors of the Castilian monarchy and nobility. By setting books such uh, as Historia de España, published in uh, about 1270 during the reign of Alfonso X, all the inhabitants of the peninsula were grouped together in the same undertaking, centralized in Castile. In Catalonia, Gothicism came later, introduced not without difficulties at the end of the Middle Ages. The early Catalan counts acknowledged themselves to be vassals of the French kings until 988, when they, de facto, and in the same way of uh, as other European feudal lords, cut their teeth to become sovereigns of their own territory. The Catalan counts therefore considered that, that Spain was the territory occupied by the Muslims. The Caliph of Cordoba was known as Rex Hispania, and this remained the, 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 the case until the 12th and 13th centuries, when the term Spain came into normal use as a geographical reference. The fact, after 1412, uh, the same dynasty that ruled the uh, real Castile also held the crown of Aragon, facilitated growing relations between the two crowns, both in exchange between elites and in cultural influences. This led to a resurgence of Gothicism in Catalonia too, although it had difficulties in assuming Visigothic legitimacy considering the Frankish origins of the Counts of Barcelona. Meanwhile, in Castile, the historiographical discourse had culminated in works like Anacephaleosis in 1455, written by Alfonso de Cartagena, who did not hold back in, the, in his claims. Los Reyes de España, entre los cuales el principal, el primero, el mayor, es el rey de Castilla y de León, the kings of Spain, among which the main and first and greatest is the king of Castile and León. The marriage of the claimant to the Castilian throne, Isabella, and the, the heir of the Aragonese crown, Ferdinand, in 1469, began the reign of the Catholic monarchs, a touchstone in the construction of the Spanish identity. The marriage was the culmination of the policy of a dynasty, the Trastamara, of Castilian origin, who concentrated all the territories where they reigned or had ruled in a single branch of the family. This was the case of Naples, conquered in 1504, and Navarra, occupied for, by Ferdinand II 
in 1512, as well as Granada, which was taken in 1492. Only Portugal remained outside the collection of inheritance, and that was by mere biological chance. However, this accumulation did not include political unification and still less a union of cultures of languages. The prestige of the name Spain and its international use to refer to the monarchy of the two crowns led some Catalan historians to try to also create the identification Catalonia Spain. But this was unsuccessful. The humanist Miquel Carbonell wrote Chronicles de Catalunya between 1495 and 1513, but it was not published until 1547 under the title Chronicles de España. There was only one edition. There were vain efforts to fight a battle that was already lost. In 1557, Christopher de Spuch, an act from Tortosa, denounced in his colloquies the insignia Ciudad de Tortosa, the assimilation of Spain with Castile. Que tots son casi de esta manera, that they are almost in this way. Que per no publicar la gloria dels espanyols que no son castellans, selen de la veritat i per fer gloriosa la sua nació, no dubten d'escriure mentides. I també quasi tots els historiògrafos castellans estan en lo mateix de voler nomenar Castella per tot Espanya. The response to the failure was the as yet embryonic construction of an alternative historical story that began to take on shades of anti-Castilian. A trend began that has continued down to the present day. The exaltation of defeat and the defeated. The speech himself has referred to the murder of Charles, Prince of Diana and heir of King uh, John II of Aragon. Of Aragon. The Castilian language penetrates Catalonia in the 15th century via the kings of the new dynasty. Although there was no deliberate intention to Castilianize the, the country. The big question is whether the new monarchies in, in, the, 60, in the 16th century had any desire to impose language as another tool for expanding a modern state. The advance of Castilian Spanish was one of the mechanisms used to construct a specific space for power within the Spanish monarchy, which was intended, intended to pull peninsular Spain together. There was a strong intellectual movement from Castile, driven by jurists, intellectuals, theologians, and historians. In one, uh, um, in 1543, the vice-chancellor of the Council of Aragon, Miquel May, uh, was arguing with the provision of the Royal Galleys in Barcelona, Alonso de Raba. Yo decía al vice-canciller, I was telling the vice-chancellor, Miquel May, en sustancia delante de cinco o seis del Consejo, que a causas nuevas era menester remedios nuevos, new causes needed new remedies que cuando se hicieron no estaban aliados el turco y el rey de Francia contra el rey de Aragón como ahora. Respondióme, entre otras pachochadas, que un día, hablándomos en Barberá con el gran canciller que le decía de estas cosas, dijo Barberá al canciller, Señor, en esta tierra también entenderemos la lengua francesa como la castellana. Sir, in this land we will understand both the French language and the Castilian one queriendo el vicecanciller aplicar lo mismo a lo que yo decía, queriendo decir, tanto nos da ser del rey de Francia como del de Castilla. This is the uh, introduction for the um, point of the political confrontation with the Spanish Habsburg Empire. 
this um, develop this development in notion during the 16th century was fed growing political dissatisfaction on both sides, both among Catalans and the royal court. There were various reasons for this. There was uh, undoubtedly a clash of political cultures. Catalonia's parliamentary system of pacts come into increasingly open, open conflict with a tradition more favorable to the, to the concentration of, of power in the king's hands. The first, the first symptoms, symptoms of this emerged very clearly in the reign of Charles V, when the empire urgent and military requirements ran up against the slow moving legalistic Catalan institutions. The, Castellaniz the Castellanization of royal posts in Catalonia aggravated the situation. Royal absentees meant the highest authority in the country was a viceroy, who were mostly Castilian during the 16th and 17th century. Of um, um, 51 viceroys, 38 were Castilian. The military presence also increased, with mostly Castilian commanders and troops who broke Catalan law whenever they felt like it. The Catalan response was to increasingly champion their, their institutions. The highest instance, the courts or parliament, depended of, uh, on being called by the king and the summoned it less and less until in the reign of Charles II, the uh, end of the 7th century. It was no longer called at all. However, it did enjoy an ephemeral renaissance between 1700 and 1705, just before and during the war of Spanish succession. We do not mean that uh, were was a direct deterministic link between the mass of authors and works advocating the political unification, unification of the peninsula and the political plans of Philip IV of Castile. Fully integrated into the intellectual context of his times, his reform program considered that political division was the main cause of the misfortunes of a monarchy that was beginning to show worrying symptoms of weakness. Apart from other previous and minor conflicts, the increase in political tension led to the war of separation of Catalonia in uh, 1640 when the Catalan sought the protection of France. Finally, the romantic version of Catalan history. As in so many other parts of Europe, romanticism and liberalism constructed a national discourse, but in the Catalan case, this was uh, done without the tools of a state, which is a very important to remember. Together with the recovery of the language and economic and political modernization in the form of industrialization, the construction of the Catalan historical discourses was part of a new political project, Catalanism. This did not attempt to separate Catalonia from the state, from the state but rather to adapt the state so the several identities called coexisted within it. An example, in the memorial de Greuges of 1885, which referred to the models from the German Empire, Austria, Hungary, and the Union of Sweden and Norway. And the 19th century Catalan nationalist rewrote the history of the country again with the clear intention of presenting themselves as the people with a mission to put right Catalonia's unfortunate history in a new relationship with Spain. This project began a debate with uh, the state which is still ongoing today.
Thank you very much. Dear Angel, thank you for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> the question of Catalonia is ever present nowadays also, and your briefly historical account, uh, I think that will help us to best understand all social and historical considerations about the Catalonia and Catalonian people, and Catalonian nation, also regarding the research questions that we will have explored in, I hope so, our conference. Then uh, I propose that we present our colleague Vera Toltz Zilitinkevich. I hope that I pronounce <laughs> uh, appropriately. She is uh, from uh, the University of Manchester, uh, the professor of Russian studies. Among her research interests are nationalism and ethnic politics in modern and contemporary Russia, intellectuals and political power under the Soviet regime, as well as Russian nation, nation building. Currently, she is a co-recipient of the research grant Reframing Russia for the global media sphere from the Cold War to Information War and uh, has successfully concluded several projects and fellowships. She had published uh, six books and over 40 papers and monographs, chapters, chapters in English and Russian, and she will present from my point of view a very interesting title that is uh, Cultural Memory in a Neo-Authoritarian State nation building or regime legitimation. Uh, the word is yours, please, dear colleague Vera. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this conference. I, uh, it's a real shame we can't meet in person, um, but we should be grateful that we have this technology to um, connect us um, virtually. I'll um, now try to open my PowerPoint presentation and then we can start. Um, If you need any help, just tell me. I think. Uh, yes. Can you? Yeah. Uh, just uh, turn on the slideshow. Thank you. And um, so, yeah, you can see the slides now, and let me. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so. Uh, my presentation takes us uh, to the present day, and I uh, understand that it's the only presentation on the contemporary situation. Um, I will use a particular case from Russia as a peg, but uh, I would like to kind of initiate a discussion about how we understand and how can we conceptualize a specific memory regime uh, which is emerging uh, today um, in a range of uh, countries, uh, some in the peripheries of Europe, such as uh, Russia and Turkey, but uh, also to some extent relevant to uh, what's happening in the very heart of Europe, for instance, Hungary, where we see also kind of um, neo-authoritarian uh, political trends uh, taking center stage. Um, and um, of course, uh, uh, in discussing uh, cultural memory of the nation uh, today, we 
um, take into account uh, the processes of the 19th century and before which most colleagues uh, participating in this conference specialize in. Um, so I will start with uh, explaining why um, I uh, began to think about the issues which um, uh, I'll be discussing in my presentation today. And that was uh, in connection with a very specific mini project I had about uh, the construction of the cultural memory of the nation through the media uh, at the time of the centenary uh, of the 1917 revolution in Russia. And of course, this uh, centenary um, was of a very important event uh, in uh, the cultural memory of Russia. Uh, in early 2017, a number of very eminent historians of Russia predicted how they thought uh, Putin's government and state affiliated media in Russia would cover the centenary. And by the end of 2017, when I was uh, kind of researching um, uh, the topic, it appeared that all these predictions were completely wrong. Uh, the prediction was that um, Putin's regime would use the conciliation and accord frame uh, to represent the events of 1917 and will also um, refer to some selective achievements of the Soviet period, such as the victory of the Soviet Union in the Second World War, uh, which is very much cultivated by Putin's regime, and um, other things such as um, Soviet sciences, uh, Soviet uh, space program, and so on, and only briefly would mention, for instance, Stalin's terror, so negative aspects of the revolutionary legacy. In reality, um, on the main state media, uh, which uh, still are sort of broadcast media, so television channels, federal television channels, um, a series of programs uh, were uh, aired. Uh, there was basically wall-to-wall -wall coverage in October and November of uh, 2017, which uh, presented uh, the Bolshevik leaders as bandits and murderers, because Lenin and Stalin, and uh, the whole Soviet legacy was presented as basically uh, the history of terror, terrorizing the population. That would, uh, this coverage, I would say, was uh, the most consistent denunciation of Soviet legacy in Russia since 1991 on state television. So nobody predicted that. Also what we have and on this slide you, you see sort of another example of complete discrepancy. So in 2017 Putin himself opened a monument to victims of Soviet repression in the center of Moscow. It's actually the first such monument. Uh, uh, in the center of Moscow, opened by the top leader of the country, um, uh, uh, Natalia Solzhenitsyn, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's wife, was uh, by Putin's side. And at the very same time, uh, in some uh, provincial localities of Russia, monuments to Stalin were erected by local authorities or local Communist Party uh, organizations. So how do we explain this chaos, basically, in um, cultural uh, memory? Uh, also, here you have a slide uh, from the website of RT, uh, Russia's main international broadcaster, uh, Russia Today, formerly. And they had, uh, again, a very different project of commemorating the revolution. It was uh, a Twitter uh, a project where uh, users or uh, watchers of RT uh, 
uh, were invited to create their own accounts and uh, tweet kind of revolutionary events in real time uh, using um, actual quotes from um, the works by uh, pr from um, the pronouncements of the people of the time and the general kind of line of uh, the main accounts managed by RT staff itself were the kind of foregrounding the progressive elements of the revolutionary legacy so quite positive account of the revolution because the whole project clearly was aimed at very left-wing extreme left-wing audiences uh, in um, the west for whom uh, the russian revolution still have a sort of kind of positive cultural meaning so even more of uh, a chaos basically around uh, memory. So uh, my question was, how do we explain this? Why uh, is clearly an authoritarian state uh, engaging in this kind of politics of memory? So that's what my paper is uh, about. And 